start the formal meeting now. Welcome to the fifth meeting in 2013 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Members and the public should turn off their mobile phones and the Blackberries as leaving them in flight mode or on silent will affect the broadcasting system. Uh, we have a, an apology from Jane Baxter this morning, uh, who is going to be replaced after 10 o'clock by the substitute Claire Baker. Um, agenda item one uh, is a discussion on taking business in private. The first item of the day is for the committee to decide whether to take item four, which is consideration of its work programme in private. Are we agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Agenda item two is subordinate legislation. And uh, the ne this uh, contains two negative instruments as listed on the agenda. Members should note that no motion to annul have been received in relation to these instruments and I refer members to the papers. Are there any questions that members have about these instruments? If there are no questions in relation to the instruments, then um, I take it that we've agreed that they should uh, proceed without comment. Okay, thank you very much. And now uh, move on to agenda item three. Uh, Low Carbon Scotland, meeting our emissions reductions targets 2013 to 27. The draft second report on proposals and policies. Uh, the third item today is for the committee to take evidence in a roundtable format on the Scottish Government's draft second report on proposals and policies known as RPP2. There will be two sessions. The first will concentrate on the themes of rural affairs issues and land use and the second on behaviour change, resource use and the scope for technical innovation across RPP2. I want to go round the table first of all to ask people to introduce themselves. I'm the convener, Rob Gibson, and as we move past the officials, the first person is Clifton. Uh, Clifton Bain, I'm the director of the IUCN UK Peatland programme. Uh, Pete Smith from the University of Aberdeen. Um, I'm the uh, um, Science Director for Climate Exchange. Claudia Beamish, uh, MSP for South Scotland and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Robin Matthews, I'm the, uh, from the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen. I'm a theme leader of the vibrant and low carbon communities there. Jim Densham from uh, RSPB Scotland. I'm a Senior Land Use Policy Officer focusing on climate change. I'm here representing Scottish Environment Link. Richard Lyle, MSP for Central Region. Rory Crawford, Seabird Policy Officer at RSPB Scotland, and I'm here representing Scottish Environment Link's Marine Task Force. We hope that Graham Kerr is going to miss us, uh, meet us, be here. <laughs> We're missing him. <laughs> I'm Nigel Don, MSP for Angus North and Mearns. Claire Baker will join us later. I'm Joe Ellis, Forestry Commission Scotland. I'm Land Use and Climate Change Policy Advisor, and I was Secretary to the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group. Um, Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Andrew Bower from NFU Scotland. Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Andrew Midgley from Scottish Land and Estates. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East and PLO to the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister. Alan Hansen from Scottish Natural Heritage. I'm Programme Manager for Land and Fresh Water. I'm the MSP for Angus South and the Deputy Convener of the Committee. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this round table. It's very important to us to get uh, what we're talking about in context. Um, the RPP2 is set against a situation where, um, in comparison to other countries, Scotland is the top of the European League table for emissions reductions. Between 1990 and 2010, emissions in Scotland fell by 22.8%. This is the largest reduction amongst the EU 15 member states and higher than the EU 27 member states average of 14.3% when emissions from international aviation and shipping and land use, land use change and forestry sectors are factored in, as it says in the RPP report um, and in paragraph 131. Uh, and as Richard Dixon said, at uh, the discussion time with stakeholder groups. Uh, it's probably the most serious attempt anywhere in Europe for a group of people, including the government, to meet really tough climate targets. In that context, um, we want to try and relate 
our efforts since the passage of the Act in 2009 via the RPP1 and leading into the RPP2. And uh, I'd like to kick off by asking whether you feel that the RPP1 has to date been effective and given a satisfactory policy framework in the sectors you represent to drive down emissions. Who wants to start? If you just indicate, that'll be fine. Clifton Bain. Um, I would just like to say from the specifically Peatland perspective, the, the RPP2 has actually got some very welcome, uh, clear signals to provide carbon abatement from peatland restoration. Uh, the fact that we've got a, a clear policy to uh, include peatland restoration in Scotland's greenhouse gas emission accounting is a, is a positive step and, and frankly it's one that uh, does show leadership uh, uh, at a global level. A lot of my work through the IUCN is now engaging countries around the world who are interested in peatlands. The IUCN World Conservation Congress has made peatlands one of its priority themes for the next five years. So I think Scotland's clear signal on that issue is, is, is good and welcome. The, uh, the other comment about the, the ability of the RPP2 to deliver, I think it's a shame there aren't more policies. The, the proposals and even the illustrative target if they were made into firm uh, commitments, it would give a, a clearer steer. And uh, I suggest that the illustrative target of about 20,000 hectares a year of restoration is reasonable. It's quite cautious, but certainly I think we could do more with the, the right steer. Um, and the, the, the other area is the funding. So it's been particularly welcome that we've got 1.7 million announced for peatland restoration for the next two, three years obviously making sure that that funding uh, is increased to the scale that will deliver the targets is, is important. And the final thing I would say is the level of carbon abatement that's identified in the RPP2 is reasonable but very cautious. So if you look at climate exchange uh, data on the carbon abatement potential, uh, they give a range. Uh, and certainly the, the government figures in RPP2 are mid-range and there's, there's definitely an opportunity to go beyond that. And it depends on us being able to deliver more restoration than, than is given in RPP2. And with 1.7 million hectares of peatland, mostly in a damaged state, we've got a, an opportunity to at least double what's uh, given as an illustrative target. Thank you. Particularly at the early stages here, tease out the links between RPP1 and RPP2. Um, we will just uh, touch on peatlands a little later on in detail and other land uses. Um, you know, panel members have been in development of RPP2 uh, to some extent, but how much? You know, because the RPP1, and I mentioned the stakeholder meetings which took place, a couple of them as far as we know. Um, what's been your engagement and how do you see the relationship between RPP1 and RPP2 we're trying to deal with at the moment? Jim Densham. Um, we have been uh, involved a little in uh, discussion with Scottish Government about um, how the targets and, and how the uh, measures themselves are being taken forward and developed. I think a number of us in this room sit on um, Scottish Government's Climate Change and Agriculture Steering Group, which helps to look at some of the measures which are affecting agriculture. Um, certainly there have been efforts to, to try and engage with us and uh, tell us about how to how we can improve the, the estimates from, uh, of abatement from things like farming for a better climate. One thing I would say about farming for a better climate, which is perhaps a, a flagship measure on reducing emissions from, from farming, is that, um, as it says in the RPP2 document, that unfortunately that, that, um, that, uh, that measure itself isn't very well monitored. So we can't really say, for example, how much uptake there is of certain measures from that at the moment and also what coverage there is of, of farmers across Scotland. So we're a little um, unsure at the moment as to how much abatement there is actually happening from Farming for a Better Climate. We would like to see more of that monitoring done and we get a clearer picture. So making um, estimates of abatement from that, from that policy um, is perhaps hopefully good guesswork but it is still guesswork at the moment. 
Um, one of the other things that we have seen uh, effective uh, in RPP1 is, as I'm sure other people will mention, is the forestry target. Um, it was below the 10,000 hectares per year annual target um, some years ago, and we're getting towards that level of, of tree planting every year. Um, and we're pleased about that, and we want to see that going on. And of course, there's been the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group, which has sat to try and agree with stakeholders um, that, that sort of target up to 2022. Uh, and so that's a good, a good thing that's happened, and, and we hope that that will continue to guide how tree planting happens. Andrew Bower? Sorry, did I get the name wrong? It is. Yeah. Um, Andrew. Yes, thank you. Um, I would agree that, you know, the, there are some things that could be improved from RPP1 with regards to farming for a better climate in terms of how it's monitored and everything like that. But it's, it's switched people on to the issue. It's switched the farming community on to the fact that it does have responsibilities in this area. And here's how those responsibilities can be delivered without compromising your business. And that's been an important message to try and get through to the farming community. And we're learning a lot of lessons as we go. Uh, and as recent as Friday at the Agriculture and Climate Change Stakeholder Group, there was quite significant discussion about how RPP1 can be built on via Farming for Better Climate or some follow-on programme to mainstream it for want of a better description. Also, a lot of what the farming can do in terms of climate change, which is sort of touched on slightly in RPP 1 and 2 is around nutrient budgeting and farming for better climate has built that into one of its um, key five themes but a lot of that's been driven via the diffuse pollution routes through SEPA and Scottish Government and Scottish Water so there is a lot happening that this doesn't necessarily encompass but you know it, it is all delivering on the same objectives. Okay. Um, Andrew Minchley. Thank you, convener. Um, you asked um, how much involvement we've had yeah. and what's the difference been. So I think it's probably fair to say there hasn't been a significant um, stakeholder process around RPP2 itself, but of the, it, uh, as what, what's already been mentioned is that there has been significant engagement on the discrete topics with, that are covered within RPP2. P2. So, for example, there's the Agriculture Climate Change Stakeholder Group, and, and many of the stakeholders around the table are involved in that. There's the Moreland Forum Peatland Working Group, which is heavily involved in taking that piece of work forward. Um, there is also the Woodland, there has also been the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group. And so I th I'd say there has been quite a lot of engagement, and the government has taken on board the outcome of those processes and, and built it into this document. The, um, the difference, it has to be an evolution, it's really not that long since RPP1. Um, but some, some of the things that were uh, in the original one, for example, the suggestion of putting some climate sort of measures in cross-compliance have come out because the context has changed. Cat reform has moved on and, and we have to work with that. So it's a reality. We're working in an evolving policy context, so we just have to deal with that. What, what I would say is, is that because of the significant engagement, I think that um, the approach that's taken is a welcome one. The, the government has um, taken the the stance that it wants to work with stakeholders it, it, say, it, from the, the farming community, try and find accommodation between sort of farming and forestry. And, it, and, it, and that is a good stance to take because it, it's trying to move forward whilst taking people along with them. Thank you for that clear view. Um, yes, um, Professor Matthews. Sorry, the sound is dealt with okay, automatically. Yeah. No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, just following on from Andrew's comment, I, I would also highlight the, the work of the uh, climate exchange, uh, Scottish Government's climate exchange programme. I, I think that's done a lot of uh, work, and um, there, there have been a number of requests coming through from the various policy teams within Scottish Government, which um, the members of these climate exchange have been able to, to address, and, and particularly relating um, RPP1 to RPP2, the one that I'm familiar with, is, is on the peatlands work. And I think in RPP1, there was a lot of uncertainty in the estimates of the activity and the areas involved in peatland restoration, um, which through CXC, the Climate Exchange, um, have uh, been narrowed down to some extent. I think there's an awful lot of work still to do on that. There's a lot of uncertainty in the, in the figures, but we have made some progress between RPP1 and RPP2, I think, in that respect. And, and that's largely due to the CXC uh, climate exchange programme. Thank you for that illustration. Yes, Graham Kerr, welcome. 
Thank you, and uh, apologies for being uh, just ever so slightly late. Um, I, I manage the farming, well, with uh, colleagues, manage the, uh, the Farming for a Better Climate programme. So just a couple of comments on that. I think as um, um, the Andrews have, uh, have said, what we've managed to do is sort of consolidate the programme within, the, um, uh, within the agricultural community. But there is a need to take it on to, uh, to its next phase, um, and phase two under, uh, under the, uh, uh, the RPP2 framework. So I think what we've done is consolidated. It's become known within the farming community. It's concentrated on win-wins. Um, and we've introduced uh, other elements latterly, like uh, adaptation and resilience building. But I think what we do need to do is sort of ramp up a little bit now, um, a focus on, uh, on nutrient management, um, and, uh, and also bringing in these other sort of multiple benefits associated with diffuse pollution, et cetera, uh, into the programme as well. We're introducing some um, knowledge from, as, uh, as, as Robin said, uh, the, cli uh, the um, climate exchange programme. So what, we were actually tr what we're actually trying to do is introduce some of the research into the programme as well. And I see in the, in the next phase of Farming for a Better Climate, one of the, the key things being on um, behavioural change. So work within climate exchange as to what actually will change farmers' behaviours beyond just win-wins, um, so financial benefits, and looking at how we can introduce those mechanisms into the, into the programme. Thank you. We'll come to some of the detail of, uh, of uh, the uh, change in behaviour and so on in due course. Um, Pete Smith, uh, before I pose another addition to this, uh, this question. Welcome. Okay, thank you. I was also going to raise the, 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 same, uh, the same comments that, that Robin has eloquently <laughs> expressed about climate exchange and the role that, that has, um, has been played by climate exchange, mainly from cool down from the policy teams, where in putting together the efficacy and the cost effectiveness of some of these measures that appear in RPP2, we've received a number of cool down requests which we've put out within climate exchange to try and put some of the numbers together that you, that you see before you in the report. Um, you also asked the question about um, RPP1 and the relationship with RPP2. Um, I think RPP1 is we're, we're currently doing the easy stuff. We're picking off the low-hanging fruit, the win-win and the win-win ones and the, the, um, the efficiency gains. As we move forward to RPP2 and as RPP2 evolves, as we move further out into the future, those low-hanging fruit have already been picked. So we, we, we inevitably move into situations where we're going to come across win-lose situations rather than win-win situations. And that's when the stakeholder engagement is going to be ever more critical. So the stakeholder engagement, I think, has ramped up between RPP1 and RPP2, but that needs to become much, much more focused with the farming community, landowners, um, ver various other stakeholder communities to, 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 so that we can work our way forward to delivering this mitigation. That's the potential's out there, um, but it's going to become ever more difficult to do that. We shouldn't underestimate the size of that challenge. Okay, um, that's a good uh, hint of a trajectory that's going to take us into perhaps win-lose, but certainly adapt uh, our behaviour in a much more fundamental way in future. But um, RPP2 also, as policies and proposals, um, should attempt to um, represent best value uh, in this process of uh, making it core to the activities of every sector of the economy. Um, can anybody comment on where the costs appear to actually fall in their sector, which would make it more difficult? Uh, Andrew Bauer? I think that if you look at the arable um, sector in Scotland, um, they are pretty well switched on to a lot of the nutrient budgeting, um, optimising efficiency measures that are being put out via Farming for a Better Climate and lots of other people. So, you know, you might start to have some problems there to extract the, you know, further efficiencies. Um, I think in the livestock sector, the, the, there's much more scope um, to um, see change there, but that's a sector that is, um, you know, that, that is probably less used to the, some of the messages that are being delivered and is less well placed to meet those challenges. 
So, you know, delivering behaviour change on Scottish livestock farms en masse is going to be um, a time-consuming and, I would say, resource-intensive process. And it, but if we want to do it, we have to put the resources in, because I don't see it happening any other way. The kind of resources? What kind of resources? What kind of resources? Well, I mean, it's my understanding. I'm not absolutely sure on the figures, but my understanding is that Farming for Better Climate's budget is of the order of £100,000. I don't think that you can reasonably expect significant behaviour change on 20,000 Scottish farms for £5 a farm or something like that. It's, it's just not going to... You know, I understand that this is a strategic priority for government. I also understand that government has lots of other priorities, but, you know, at some point in time we, we need to either make that commitment or look elsewhere, because I don't think it's achievable by any other means. Okay, that's, that's the kind of thing we should Clifton Bain. Yeah, and on, with regard to the peatlands, there's an interesting element with the, the costs. You have some initial upfront funding uh, because of the, the, the state of the peatlands, many of them damaged, requiring capital works to repair them. And so the land managers, in a way, get that upfront payment. That's all well and good. But what we've failed over the, the last few centuries, we've failed to recognise the value of the natural services that the habitat provides. And going into the future, it's all very well to repair a peatland, but if it then has no ongoing economic value that the land manager recognises, we're not paying for that economic service. And so there's always this pressure to perhaps turn it into something else more profitable. But if you look at the value of the peatlands, the, the carbon, the water, the, the wildlife, the, the tourism, those values could be reflected. And one of the areas of work that we're involved in is trying to look at how the downstream beneficiaries, and that could be society or it could be an individual uh, water company, how they then help invest in maintaining the peatland in a healthy condition. So there's that element to the, the cost. So your initial upfront payment is good, but we need to make sure that there's ongoing uh, recognition of the value of the peatlands so that the land manager sees that value. The other point I was going to make was the timing. With peatlands, the longer you leave them to decay, the more deteriorated they become, the more costly the restoration is, the longer it takes to get the carbon benefit. So getting in there quickly, in the same analogy as repairing the, the loose tiles before a big hole appears in your roof, it is more effective and, and costly, uh, cost effective to, to do that. So I would say the, the money that's made available for peatlands, make sure it, uh, it helps repair early. We're looking at a cost of 15 million a year uh, to deliver the, the illustrative target in the RPP2. That isn't the ongoing cost. Once you've restored the peatland, it locks up the carbon potentially for thousands of years. So it's not an ongoing cost. So uh, that's an important one to recognize. And uh, the costs can be shared across departments. I've said to the, this committee before, there's opportunities for money to come from CAP, as well as from the water companies, as well as private businesses who are interested in carbon markets. And, and one of the things I think we need to do is engage that sector more. So there is a range of income, but the Scottish government's money is vital as a sort of pump priming and, uh, and making sure things happen. Well, we're trying to deal with some general things. So I'm going to come back to Peatland in a minute, but Tim and Claudia wanted to come on to that. Was it in the it's section? It's a general point, convenient, right. yes, in so, the section. In the section. Yes. Well, Claudia first and then Jim Densham to follow. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to um, put a, another question to the panel members, and they may or may not have a comment on it, but it's in relation to the EU targets um, in terms of the effectiveness of the RPP2 and whether um, if the target is not changed from 20% to 30%, whether that would have any implications for the sectors that the people here today on the panel are representing. So let's put that into the, into the mix of the general discussion. Jim. Thank you, convener. I'll, I'll answer your question first and then come on to Claudia's okay, question. Um, I agree with Andrew that you know, a lot of the costs, or some of the costs at least, of implementing some of the agriculture measures will be you know, on farmers to, to pay for, but as we know, many of them, especially nutrient efficiency measures, the costs come back, the, the payment comes back, and, and, and overall it's a, it's a, uh, it's a zero-cost measure. Actually, you, know, you can make money by using less nutrients and applying less, et cetera. Um, but even though we know that around 
around this table, you know, not every farmer knows that. And so there needs to be enough money in, in initiatives like Farming for Better Climate in order for you know, this sort of behavioral change to happen um, and, and for people to break habits and to do new things and to, to see new technologies and the benefits of these, of these new practices. So we, you know, I reiterate that what Andrew's point, we do need significant money to make that happen across Scotland. And of course, the other area that money can come from, which government has some control of, is, is SRDP funds, which will fund many of the things which are good for locking carbon into soil, as Clifton's mentioned, but also in, in agriculture landscapes. Um, and of course, we know through um, current negotiations that the cap budget may be cut, um, and, and unfortunately, the, the majority of that, um, that cut may do be disproportionately on pillar two and on rural development funds. So it's a, it's a call for government to, to, be, um, to be backing up a future SRDP with, with sufficient funding to really maximize that and, and money towards agri-environment funding so that these sort of initiatives, this carbon saving measures can really be funded in part through SRDP and, and maximize the carbon benefits of those. And then to, to come on to the the EU target effectiveness. Um, we haven't seen a move from 30 uh, to 30% yet from 20% in Europe. And um, although we, you know, we hope to see that as soon as possible, and that's obviously on the traded sector. As the, um, the UK Climate Change Committee said, without a move to 30%, it puts greater pressure on the non-traded sectors, such as rural land use, um, and agriculture to achieve the extra if we're going to meet our 42% targets. I mean, that uh, affects transport <coughs> and homes too. Um, so without that move, we are, um, people around this table are seeking, you know, seeing great, great pressure. Um, and as, as you can see from um, the stock climate chaos um, evidence that has been given to the committee and from the, the report itself, the RPP2 report itself, without that 30% target, it's hard to meet all of the annual targets um, that uh, the Parliament has set um, to achieve our, our obligations. Um, and in fact, um, without that 30% target, we, um, and, and with the proposals and with all the policies um, in place, we still only hit eight targets and, and we missed seven. So we really do need that 30% target and we need um, UK government to continue to put pressure in Europe to make sure that that 30% is hit. But we also, it also means that because we can't rely on that, we need to maximize domestic policies in order to achieve the targets that we, that we ourselves have control of. Um, Alan Hampson. Thank you, Convener. Um, I mean, we, we obviously very much welcome the, the emphasis on, on peatland restoration and um, the money, the 1.7 million that's been directed towards that. But I think we've also got to start looking beyond peatland as well. I mean, in terms of sequestration, there are other um, sectors. I mean, the blue carbon um, ideas that are now coming out in relation to the sea. And I think within peatland itself, we've also got to think about minimising the losses to peatland through development. And I mean, there's not necessarily a cost associated with, with that, um, and also from, from extraction. But I think beyond that, it, we need to look at the bigger picture as well, because what we're talking about in relation to peatland is largely sequestration, which in terms of the targets will take us so far, but really what we need to do is start tackling some of the big challenges around, around reduction. And there, I mean, I think there are, there's scope for a lot of synergy. Um, I mean, from, the, from our point of view, the act of travel um, encourage more people to walk and cycle either to work or in terms of their recreation opportunities. There's, there's, there's plenty of scope there to, to help people meet the target of 30 minutes of, of exercise per day. Um, in terms of the way in which uh, developments are, are, are taken forward, where people are located in terms of residence and, and work, I mean, again, that can, can help with the, the act of travel. There's not necessarily a big cost. In fact, in some cases, there may be cost savings associated with that. Um, and I think there's also opportunity to strengthen the links between um, agricultural emissions, um, food, and the health agenda um, as well. Um, some of the, the, the high carbon foods are also very high in saturated fat, which is, is an issue with, um, with health. And in terms of food, 
I mean, that takes us into the whole food waste issue, which, you know, as we hear now, is, is highly significant. And there's, there's, there's a, a massive opportunity there in terms of reducing um, not just waste generally, but greenhouse gas emissions through that. And again, the cost of that may, may be less significant than it would be in, uh, in other areas. Um, in terms of the EU targets, and I think we are starting to see the European Union take the whole climate change agenda um, f uh, you know, to the heart of, of key policies, um, common agricultural policies, a lot of debate now about the extent to which the environmental benefits being thought, sought through greening uh, can help us deliver on, on climate change, and that's both in terms of um, greening the, um, the Pillar 1, the uh, single farm payment type payments, but also the sort of measures that can be supported under Pillar 2, the, the SRDP, as has been alluded to earlier. So I think there's, there are a range of approaches with varying degrees of, of cost associated with them, but I think it's important to kind of have that bigger perspective on it rather than just focus in on the, the cost um, at an individual sector level. Um, Rory Crawford. Welcome Alan's intervention there about blue carbon. Um, I'm a bit of an odd fish here on this panel because, uh, <laughs> quite literally, because <clears throat> everyone else is very much on terra firma and I'm a bit of a sea dog. Um, but I welcome that intervention on blue carbon because it's essential and it's not particularly, marine is not particularly well covered in the RPP and that's possibly the reason the committee's asked for some marine evidence which is most welcome. Um, as human beings, I think we do tend to focus on the, on the terrestrial because that's where we're most comfortable. But Scotland's got a vast marine area, much larger um, than a land area, and blue carbon sinks are, are critical and could be viewed in the way that committees embraced peatlands and looked at peatland restoration. We should be looking at blue carbon in the same way. So when we say blue carbon, we're talking about things like kelp beds, seagrass beds, um, and salt marshes as well. And salt marshes in particular are an interesting one because hugely important for biodiversity. There's options there to actually restore salt marshes that we've lost, and there's been a huge historical decline in salt marshes around Scotland. Uh, and so we've got a potential there for a win-win. And indeed, I worked on the Marine Bill when it was going through Parliament, another great piece of legislation that's come from the Scottish Parliament alongside the Climate Change Act. And there's a duty in the, in the Marine Scotland Act to, um, to look at mitigation, or there's a duty to, for mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And there's an opportunity there to use marine protected areas and other measures within the, in the Marine Scotland Act to do something about blue carbon and better account for it. So currently it's not part of the scope of our discussions, but I think it's important to bring those elements in. Um, and I think we'll be getting more onto marine matters later. There's a few other things to say about protected areas and, and their contribution to climate change, mitigation and adaptation as well. Thank you for that. You'll forgive us for not discussing the F word because we've been dealing with the Aquaculture and Fisheries <laughs> Bill um, for quite some weeks now. Uh, hence the reason why you may be the sole uh, sea dog. Um, but um, to try and stick on land for the moment, um, I think we've got to uh, just, just to nail down the peat sort of situation. It struck me that the relationship between RPP1 and RPP2 is that we have gained more information and research has done that. The proposals which are uh, you know, laid out earlier are now being slightly more firmed up. And I refer, for example, to uh, the question about uh, I mentioned in the technical document 4.6.36, where it says that counteracting the emission savings, uh, which can come from rewetting, there's an initial spike in methane emissions caused by anaerobic digestion of the rewetted peat. Um, this may offset the emissions savings by 10 to 20 per cent in early years. There's considerable uncertainty regarding these numbers. That document and this comment um, shows us that you cannot move to policies that are absolutely firm until you have got the research right. Uh, and I take it that, uh, therefore, if we're to reach a peatland plan, which has been proposed by SNH, uh, that Clifton Bain might want to first of all kick off about whether the pace of policy development is enough to achieve the 21,000 hectares per annum uh, restoration target. So the, <clears throat> the first thing, the, the IUCN Commission of Inquiry looked at that issue, is, is the policy development fit for purpose, if you like? And the, the key thing that came out was You've got to have clear signal from government that uh, this is a direction we want to go. We don't want our peatlands in a damaged state causing problems. We want to start restoring, enhancing and protecting them. Um, 
Government ministers following the inquiry across the UK, I'm pleased to say, environment ministers have all stated their intention to protect and enhance peatlands. So that's a very clear signal, which we didn't have. That's now clear to all the, the variety of public bodies, as well as to private individuals and businesses, that this is a direction we need to go. So we have that now. We're no longer questioning, is it good to restore peatlands for climate change? The actual quantification of the, the benefits, yes, it's still got a long way to go. I would say, though, that we've got enough to give us ballpark, and, and Pete and Robin will, will give, give some more, I'm sure, but we've got enough ballpark. The methane issue is small within the potential gains, and if we're looking at timescales of between now and 2027, the methane spike will have gone within a few years from most of the restoration projects. Um, and in, in effect, as well, we're finding that the more we look at the peatlands, the less of an issue that methane spike becomes, because it was a particular type of peatland restoration that was causing some of the high numbers. So we do need to improve the research, we need to improve the science, but we mustn't let that stop the, the, the steamroller, if you like, of policy development. The other point is that the policy development's needed in order to deliver our biodiversity objectives for peatlands anyway. So this is work we should be doing. And the restoration rate since 1990 has been quite small. Um, and so the, the biodiversity gains have been small, the, the carbon gains have been small. If we ramp up to 20,000 hectares a year, we can achieve that. And as I say, the science will read rapidly Come, come to being good enough for, for international accounting, I would say, and there's international advice coming forward. The crucial thing is not to lose the momentum, and I think the, the three things I would say that would, would make the, the policy development achieve our, our targets are coordination across the, the different public bodies. Peatlands are affected by a wide range of sectors, as I said, forestry, environment, water, planning, amongst a few and getting coordination across these public bodies to agree to ramp up their efforts to, to meet some targets. Getting the funding right, and it is a combination of money from different departments and, and ensuring that the Scottish Government gives some clear pump priming. And then the final element is partnerships. We have seen successes in peatland restoration at the largest scale, covering several thousand hectares in places like the Flow Country, evidence from, from England and Wales where partnerships with a clear lead body, and it can be an existing body like Scottish Natural Heritage or Cairngorms National Park or Tweed Forum, something like that, who've got the capacity to coordinate activity around a large group of landowners. Often these big peatlands have several landowners or land managers, and so it's important to have a, a body that can bring them together, shared objective, introduce the money, draw in and down, draw down additional money, and that way you get progress on the ground. So we know how to do that. I think we've now got the clear policy steer. We need the agencies working together. And then the, the last bit, it's a sort of feedback loop. Once people start doing peatland restoration, we rapidly need to ensure that there is money available, not as a luxury, but as an essential tool to pay for monitoring research and survey. We need to learn about the carbon science from the projects that we do. Otherwise, we'll be in that problem of not having enough science to go forward. So as we develop the restoration, let's not see research and monitoring as a luxury. Let's see it as essential to um, improving our knowledge to then speed up the process of delivering more restoration. I'm trying to highlight this myself by becoming the species champion for uh, the rusty bog moss, which um, is a really important part of peat in the making. Uh, and, you know, it's by getting people's attention to these things at a popular level, I think that's going to be quite important. Uh, Robin Matthews, want to add anything there just now? Uh, well, yes, actually, I could just um, add on. I think Al um, Clifton has been very eloquent in, in, um, in uh, uh, describing the, the general situation. I'd just say that... Um, in relation to the methane issue, um, again, through climate change, uh, climate exchange, we've, we've done a little bit of work on that in reviewing literature. Um, and while, while it does have some effect, I think the, the, main, um, the, the main point there is that it's, it's fairly short-lived, and I think Clifton has, has just highlighted that too. 
Um, I would say too that we have just appointed a researcher at uh, the James Hutton Institute who will be looking at this aspect. Uh, he's going to be looking at greenhouse gas emissions from peatlands and also other land use change as well, but that will be one of his first uh, jobs and he's starting in two weeks' time. So we should have better data on that, I, I hope, within the next year or so, which um, should help to make these, um, uh, these decisions um, a, a bit more solid. Um, I think the, the only other point I would make is that the time frame is important. If we're looking at the uh, changes in carbon in restored peatlands, uh, we are talking thousands of years, as again Clifton mentioned at the beginning, uh, whereas the, the methane emission issue is really only in the first few years. And I think um, you know, while there is an offset there it, in the long run, it's, it's not very significant at all. Um, and, of course, we must also take into account the co-benefits associated with peatland restoration as well in terms of the impacts on biodiversity and other things too. Uh, Jim Densham, followed by uh, Alan Hampson, and then uh, Andrew Midgley and Pete Smith and to round up this particular section just now. So, Jim... Briefly. We welcome the um, inclusion of, of peatlands as a... As well as the policy and then the proposal in RPP2, seeing that as an improvement on RPP1. And um, Clifton's spoken well on what was needed to achieve that, that 21,000 hectares a year. Um, I think, as you know, um, RSPB Scotland has um, uh, peatland land holding in, in the north of Scotland, and we are very keen to you know, be part of that work, as well as other Scottish Environment Link members who not just uh, look at and manage blanket bog and try to restore that, but also lowland uh, raised bogs. So that's an important thing to mention too. The committee have visited yes. raised bogs in the lowlands. <laughs> and one of the other things to, you asked, you know, what, what, is it enough to achieve this, this target? I would just note that um, the wording of, of the proposal is, um, we should be careful about because it says that um, the 21,000 hectares per year of peatland restoration is technically, leaf, technically feasible. So I would say that it's not a formal target as such. It, it says that it's feasible, which gives a little bit of a wriggle room that it could be less. So I would like, if this committee can recommend that that does become a formal minimum target so that we, we really try to achieve that every year and not say, well, we, it wasn't technically feasible this year, but it will be, we're aiming for that. It should be something that we're really aiming for, that we aim to get all players involved in and trying to achieve as soon as possible. So we see those, that carbon locked up uh, forever. Alan Hed Hampson. Thank you. I mean, many of the points that have been raised are, are of course, what the uh, Peatland Plan will be trying to, to address. Um, I think, you know, as Clifton said, the coordination across public bodies is important. I think the coordination across sectors is, is important as well. We've got to think about the socio-economic um, aspects as well. Um, a couple of things to add, though. I think that the targeting of the available resource is crucial, um, as you were saying, convener, in relation to best value. But I think also we've got to be making sure that the effort is targeted to where it's going to be delivering the, the best return in terms of peatland restoration. Um, so. There's, there's, um, there's a job to be done there in making sure that um, we're, not, we're looking at um, uh, what should we say, the scale of restoration which will reap the, the best benefits. There's a, there's a risk that we have a very scattergun approach with lots of small-scale restoration projects that aren't necessarily addressing some of the bigger issues to do with hydrology and, and, uh, and the integrity of some of these larger um, bog systems. Um, the other thing I think that I'd like to add is just the importance of a baseline. I mean, we need to, as part of that plan, get a clear, um, established sort of idea of where we are um, with the best available signs so that we can demonstrate the progress that we make um, through the money that's invested. Thank you. Um, we, we take Andrew first and then Pete, so that we get a scientific end to it rather than the land manager one. Andrew, Thank um, yeah, the point I was going to make was a, a kind of a, a delivery one, a land management one, which was uh, to, to reinforce a point that Clifton made about, about um, the importance of, of facilitation. It's how do you get the delivery on the ground in large areas? And I just, it, it just rang a bell um, on, a, on, a, on a different issue, but it, re it, it illustrates the importance of facilitation and, and enabling people to deliver. So 
Um, some of our members tell us how appreciative they are about the work of the land management advisors in the Lomond and Trussex National Park. Um, they're coordinating work across large areas for black grouse. And, and their engagement in that process has been entirely positive because um, they, they effectively um, have been enabled to work together to deliver a positive outcome. And they see that their, their position in the park has been positive and they value the, the role that the park has played. And so it highlights the, the potential for um, effectively replicating something like that to enable people to work together. The, the other point I want to make is to do with, to do with best value, the, the, the initial point that you raised, and it's something that hasn't been touched upon greatly. It's the, the, the potential for other markets, the, the CSR, corporate social responsibility, potential markets, and, and the, it's, the, the relationship between public money and, and private investment in delivering these outcomes is, is a difficult one. And it may be that some public money could be used to unlock a much bigger uh, potential avenue of funding, and that would deliver a, a, a larger outcome for public money rather than just trying to achieve it all through public money. There's, there's, a, there's a potential avenue there. And uh, Pete Smith, finally, in this section. Yep, so the, uh, the, the committee will be well aware, having had scientists before them many times, that you rarely um, get scientific certainty from scientists. And if you wait for scientific certainty, you'll be waiting a very long time. So it's good, it's good to see that the policy is moving ahead with the, with the best available knowledge. What we, what we can't do, what we can rarely do is provide certainty, but what we can do is we can put the bounds around it. We can quantify the uncertainty associated with some of these things. So, so, so science is a, is a critical issue. So, so when, we, when we move forward with the peatland restoration, to add to Alan's point and to Clifton's point, it's essential for, for a very relatively small additional cost. We should make sure that we monitor and um, uh, monitor the, the progress and to measure the emissions from, from these peatlands. It's got a number of, ish, number of benefits. Firstly, is that it established the baseline, which, which Alan mentioned, so that we know where we're moving from and where we're moving to, so that we can um, evaluate the efficacy of the, of, the, of the processes. We also know that peatlands aren't just, we call them peatlands, but they're a very diverse set of ecosystems. This will allow us to target better those where we're going to get the, the maximum return in terms of not just mitigation, but biodiversity enhancement and such like. So as we move forward, we may decide that certain types of peatland deserve more, in, more investment, certain types of peatlands, levels of degradation would be less beneficial. So, so that scientific issue, as a scientist, of course, I would be asking for, for, for more research, but I think it makes a, a whole bunch of sense on, on a number of issues. The last one being that we need to report um, under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change the, the removals, the, the mitigation that we've achieved from these peatlands. And with the proposals that are coming forward from the IPCC guidance, there will be a set of sort of fairly generic tier one emission factors that will be used for peatlands. They may not cover all of the diverse practices and peatland types that we have in Scotland. So we will probably need to move towards national tier two, what's called tier two estimates, which are nationally appropriate ones that we can use to better quantify and to better report on our emission reductions. And all of that data that we collect during these early phases of peatland restoration will be important for putting together that package of science to develop those tier two methods. So for a relatively small investment, I think it will, um, will deliver quite a lot that will help us going forward. That's excellent. Um, no doubt we'll come back to this in greater detail, but in terms of RPP2, it gives us a good steer. Uh, moving seamlessly on to rural affairs and land use questions, uh, Claudia Beamish posed the first one. Sorry, convener. Back in the moving first. Back. <laughs> Go back. Mesmerised by the peatland. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, we we brought that forward because there was so much discussion about it it's right. before the peatland <laughs> questions. Right. Uh, do the panel members feel that the RPP two is clear and indeed visionary enough? In I think it's it's related to land use in the previous section. Sorry. Um, question five. I think we agreed number five. Right, okay. Thank Please. you for bearing with me. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Apologies, I'm everyone. intrigued by the discussions. So. Right. <laughs> um, whether uh, it's important for the panel to highlight for us whether the limited definition of rural land use is reasonable 
and whether the document satisfactorily reads across to all other sectors. Okay, anyone want to start? Quite a challenging Alan, question. Alan Hampson for a start, thank you. I could start. I mean, I, I think the document flags up the opportunities, particularly for reduction in a broad range of sectors. But as I said earlier, I think it's possibly the synergies um, between those sectors that we need to draw out more. Um, I mean, the act of travel, the op you know, the opportunities for people to to to, um, to, to take holidays which involve cycling and uh, and walking without the risk of going on on major roads, for example. Um, you know, there are a number of areas like that where I think we could make stronger links. Um, also, the, as I said earlier, the, the link between food and health and, and agricultural emissions. I mean, I think that's an area. And when you bring in food waste as well, um, there's a lot in that that could be uh, could be spelt out more clearly. Okay, uh, Robin Matthews. Uh, um, Alan mentioned the um, the links and the synergies, but I think we also have to remember too there could be trade-offs between between the different sectors as well. So that if we re you know achieve emission reductions in one particular area, that it could just pop up somewhere else, and and not only within Scotland. I think we have to remember too that we could be exporting some of the problems abroad. So that um, you know, for example reducing livestock numbers or you know, other land use changes. Um, you know, we're still eating, we're still consuming uh, meat, for example. Uh, is it just uh, putting it somewhere else? And I, I'm not sure that there's enough of that in the uh, RPP2 to, um, to, to take that into account. So we need to look at the wider picture, I think, uh, both nationally and globally, I would say. Thank you. Um, Robin, thank you for that. Anyone else on that particular point that Claudia has asked? No? Do go on. Thank you. With that and, theme. Uh, could, could the panel also highlight for us what technical abatements the government might be talking about for the period of uh, 2025 to 27, and why these should uh, take so long? Uh, Jim, yes. Um, this is something that we we have noticed as. Um, Obviously, included as a proposal in, in this in this RPP2, and as I said before, we'd had quite a few conversations with um, with the, through the climate change and agriculture stakeholder group to clarify how things were being improved and and how certain abatement estimates were being were being changed and being improved upon. But this is something which has suddenly appeared in a way um, that we hadn't had any notice of, and so we were. We, we saw that it's, it's heavily backloading abatement to the years 2025 to 27. And, and looking in the technical annex of the RPB2, there really isn't sufficient um, explanation as to what this does. It talks about modeling um, and related to other policies, but we're, we're certainly not clear. And especially as seeing this is a heavy, you know, it's a lot of abatement that it is, is estimating to, to achieve. We think it should be a lot clearer. And there, are read across, there is a read across to other sectors here because it also appears in the transport section as technical abatement. It's trying to do a similar thing to say there will be abatement later on. And even in the homes and uh, well, yeah, the homes section, there is a techno technical potential which is there, which again, colleagues who work on these sectors are saying there is not sufficient detail to really understand from those scrutinizing this report what this is about. Um, perhaps if it was a, a smaller amount of abatement, um, it would be less worrying. But because there's a large amount of abatement that is, is estimating there to, to achieve the targets, then we, we are concerned what this is all about. Thank you. <coughs> Andrew Bauer. I think some of the technical abatement sounds very, I suppose, fancy to some people's ears. In, in our mind, there are some technical abatement options that are available right now. Um, you know, the, the issue of drainage and um, sediment management is one that's you know, exercising a lot of people in the farming community at the moment. We're not here advocating that we should be draining our uplands or our peatlands, definitely not. But we definitely do need to look at the issue of drainage and how that can optimise use of fertilisers and minimise emissions. Um, looking further forward, um, potentially, there are some fairly thorny issues in here, like GM, which are contentious issues, and that's, that's a broader issue. But I don't think that we can, we can ignore these kind of um, 
challenging messages to society, we're also looking to the land use strategy to some extent to deliver policies that are relevant to where the, to the context. So if, if we really want to start delivering some of what's in here, we need policies, be they environmental regulation policies or not, that optimise the use of our most productive ground with some kind of baseline safeguards there, whilst accepting that there are large parts of the country where that kind of activity is not appropriate and there should be other priorities there. So technical abatement can be very technical or it can be pretty simple and going back to what we've done in the past but we've rather gotten out of the way of. Pete Smith. Yeah, looking at it from the outside it does appear that the the, the technical abatement that's mentioned seems to be the gap between what we know we could achieve and what we need to achieve. And this looks like we'll, we'll put a number in there which makes up the gap and something will come along. It looks more like wishful thinking than something that's actually got a plan behind it. So in, in my opinion, that needs to be fleshed out. Um, OK, there are some technical... These are all technical, technical options, actually, the ones that we're applying now. So just giving, giving it the name technical doesn't make it more credible. We need some more, um, more detail behind it. That's a good thing. N uh, Nigel yeah, Don. On this point, because I, th I think Professor Smith's comment seems, seems to me to be a fair interpretation of those kind of numbers raw, raw from the page. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how the research institutes who are represented here feel about that though in, in the context of the history of research because of course it is a matter of definition that we don't know what we're going to discover later. We never have so wonderful you can't put it in the plan. What you can do is say well actually we've been remarkably good over a period at learning how to do things and actually that has enabled us to make abatements therefore maybe it is credible to say in the future that trajectory is reasonable. So I guess it's the kind of reasonableness without being too optimistic of that kind of expectation that I'm, that I'm wondering whether folk could comment on. Pete, come back. It, what looks fishy is that there's no technical abatement potential until 2025, and then it ramps up, and suddenly it pops up in 2025, and then miraculously jumps up. It doubles, no, sorry, it doubles in the first year, and then another 250, um, uh, 250 megatons CO2 um, units to be confirmed. I the point very well. Um, first of all, Andrew Bauer, then uh, Pro uh, Professor Matthews. One of oh, the, sorry, convener. One of the you know specific examples in there is around anaerobic digestion, and that is one of these. Thorn in some respects, it's a thorny issue because is the public happy with the idea of that process? And you know, we all have foot and mouth and things like that, and BSE in our. Um, minds from the past, you know, we, we feel that the research is, is firming up and that that is a safe way forward, but that's a discussion that has to happen with the general public to say this is an essential part of farming meeting its obligations. I think there's also a practical issue there and that I'm not quite sure. Certainly anaerobic digestion hasn't received the focus here in Scotland that it has down south. Um, our view is that, that that's with good reason and that it's a very labour intensive process for a lot of farmers and unlikely at any kind of small scale to be an attractive option, but there is maybe a role there in some kind of hub system of anaerobic digesters serving larger areas, and these could be professionally managed, and that might be some way to deliver anaerobic digestion that, that is attractive to some farmers. Um, we will take that one forward as well. Um, coming back to Robin Matthews. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. I mean, just uh, following on from the, the question over here, I, th I think there are a number of um, interventions on the horizon we could we could probably think of, um, rather than just leaving it as a as a sort of um, amorphous gap, as, as Peter's said. Um, essentially, I think what what it is is if you look at the the work that SAC and and um, Maluri did uh, on the the MAC curves, the marginal abatement cost curves. There's, there's all those interventions below the line, which essentially uh, farming for a better climate, I think, is targeting um, the win-win situation. But there's also a lot of, above the line, which are going to cost money um, at the moment, but also will deliver uh, carbon savings potentially. And I think we need to focus on, that, on those ones. Um, so, some of them, just for example, uh, are the use of le uh, legume and, and grass mixtures using biological nitrogen fixation, for example. There's nitrification inhibitors, uh, work that's going on at uh, James Hutton. Um, there's a whole heap of things like bioenergy, the use of bioenergy crops and trying to expand those. 
um, agroforestry systems and, and, and also livestock management, and, and there are probably a lot more that you can think of as well. And all of these were above the line because they essentially are essentially going to cost money, but we probably do have to think about moving into that area if we're going to achieve these reductions. So I would say that we can probably start to fill that amorphous gap with some specific things, um, bearing in mind the, the costs involved in it, of course. Um, Joe Ellis? From that, I think in the, the um, forestry measures that mentions, it mentions woodlands in and around towns, and some of the sites there, vacant and derelict land sites particularly, can require very costly mediation, might be lots of different owners. Um, they're, not, they're not easy, they're not cheap to do, but if we have to meet, if we have to fill this gap, um, over time we could develop those partnerships and put in that investment and achieve that. So I think it would kind of twist arms to make things happen that perhaps wouldn't have happened without that stretch. Um, I think we'll move on, uh, given that we've got two or three more questions, at least in this section. Uh, Graham Day has a point yeah. on the... Thank you, Kavir. On, really on the subject of twisting arms, um, according to stock claim at Kale Scotland, the rural land use section of RPP2 lacks credibility because the policies and proposals affecting agriculture rely too heavily on voluntary uptake. So I guess my question is, in light of that, to what extent can we trust the sector to do its bit without the government becoming more prescriptive? Andrew. A good example of how this could be done. It does have a regulatory backstop there, but um, the way that SEPA is delivering its diffuse pollution priority catchment work in partnership with the agricultural community it has provided a real model and a fair bit of inspiration to us that we can achieve behaviour change and that farmers will respond to things that in some cases are win-wins but in some cases are going to cost them money and not give them anything back. That you know, has entailed massive uh, expenditure and resources on the part of SEPA but it's delivering results. Yes, there's a regulatory backstop there but you know, if you, were, if you were a farmer, you wouldn't necessarily, in the course of one of these inspections, feel like the big stick of uh, regulation was being held over you. But the feedback we're getting from SEPA is farmers are responding incredibly positively to it. If I can contrast that with the NVZ situation, nitrate vulnerable zones, that's a very um, prescriptive, rigorous system which is fairly universally loathed and um, has caused all sorts of issues there. So I think we've got quite a nice example on one hand of how to do it and the other example, the, the, the old model, if you want to say, you beat them with a stick until they submit to what you want them to do. Uh, but actually they don't, I don't think, in, in reality. Okay, Jim Henson. Jim. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, well, I would agree that uh, see there is... Um, too great uh, a focus on voluntary measures um, from, from the land use sector. I was just looking for a figure. I think it's something like 64% um, of the savings are from, from, uh, are from proposals which are in general voluntary. Um, well, I guess one of the things that the proposal that is there, as, as has been alluded to, is this nitrogen efficiency measures and um, getting farmers to if they're not taking up farming for better climate measures, pushing them into that through the threat of a regulation. Our concern is that the way it's worded is that there's no, there's no date set for that to come in place, and there's also no suggestion that there would be, at the moment, any regulatory cutoff, which is, or any trigger point. So what that does is effectively says to, to farmers, if you're not taking up these measures by a certain date or by a certain, if there's not, uh, you know, 70% of you doing it by this date, we will start to prepare legislation to give us sort of a threat. At the moment, there is no real threat there. They could carry on and say, well, there's, no, there's been no threat placed upon us. So we would like to see that put in place. We would like to see a clear date, a clear process outlined to make that, to make that happen. Obviously, we would like it ought to be done voluntary, as, as Andrew is saying, you know, that, that would be the ultimate thing so that, you know, in a few years' time, everyone is seeing the benefit to themselves and their businesses of doing nitrogen efficiency measures. Um, but we know that not everyone will, and, and we need to see, they need to see a process of making that happen. Graham Kerr. Thank you. I mean, the, the, um, the issue of voluntary versus 
um, mandatory uptake is, is quite a, a difficult one. Um, it's pleasing to hear that we're still talking about the industry having an opportunity to, um, uh, to undertake it on a voluntary basis, but having this um, uh, potential uh, intervention in order to, uh, to more forcibly encourage the change. The, the way that farmers do go about things and making decisions about change is really pretty complicated. Um, I mean, if we think about why we change our broadband on our, or our, our, our energy supply or whatever, there, there are all sorts of different things that come into it beyond uh, just, uh, just the finances. And the, the, the way that the, um, uh, the, the change has been encouraged at the moment is on the basis of these win-wins. But there's more to it on that uh, than, than that, just about the financial change. I think farmers have to, uh, have to actually realise that the change that they make would have a benefit. And I think the success of the SEPA initiatives is that they can actually see that the erosion on the bank um, and the, the, the animals going into the water course is actually having an impact on water quality. They can, they can visibly see that. With climate change, it's a little bit more, uh, more difficult. So we have to convince them about um, uh, and inform them about, uh, about climate change and, and, and its impacts. And um, that, uh, to date, has been kind of uh, pretty well demonstrated by the, um, the uptake or the, the, um, the interest that we've had in a recent event on drainage and soil aeration. We've had really, uh, you know, three bad winters. Um, we put on an event uh, to discuss drainage and 300 farmers turn up to the event. So, you know, that, that's about something that, they, you know, that they're, is real to them uh, and they can make change. The other thing is that they have to have in order to, to, to make the change is, is a capacity to change. Um, and that, that is where I think in this um, certainly short term uh, period of RPP2 um, with the nitrogen efficiency measures, there is still a, a high degree of capacity to change on, on farmers' farms, whether it be in the arable sector or whether it be in the livestock sector. So I think within this period you know, 2013 to 2018, 2020, um, w with the um, right information to farmers in order to make them understand about some of the impacts, um, some of the triggers about resilience building, building that into the program, uh, but in, in encouraging um, change and farmers having the capacity to do that, particularly in nitrogen efficiency, we've still got an opportunity to get some of the way towards a 90% uptake. Thank you. Uh, Alan Hams. <laughs> you covered the, the points I was going to make, but I think there is something about a, a clear message that I was going to add, though, um, and that is the, the, the clarity of guidance as well for, for the farmers as to what it is they have to actually do. I mean, I think the, the land manager has to feel confident that they can make those changes, and I think part of the message has got to be about the, the benefit for them that some of these changes will have as well. I mean, moving to lower carbon systems and, and the benefits that that can have for their business. Uh, and uh, Andrew Bauer? Yeah, I, I think the sector might accept that it's not been, um, it's not embraced the climate change agenda as quickly or as fully as some other parts of the economy. We've got to be honest with ourselves in that one. Farming for a Better Climate has done a great job setting uh, the, the kind of the playing field out. The, you know, this is our membership magazine. This is the first of a series of six articles that are being produced for us by SEC Consulting. So we can start via ourselves, Scottish Land and Estates, SEC, whoever it might be, start to communicate there. But we are talking about 20,000 businesses. If you want to influence power generation, you go and talk to two companies. And it's, it's done quickly. So the, the behaviour change and the complexities around that, I think, are going to be the biggest challenge. Okay, that's uh, well put. Um, I think we should move into the agriculture sector. Jim Hume is going to lead. Yes, uh, thanks. thanks very much, Convener. We've heard from Professor Smith that we've maybe uh, pick, picked, or at least are picking the, the, the lower fruits, and the, there's little, uh, some criticism of the detail in here, how we're going to actually um, further uh, our, our uh, meter targets, climate change targets, and of course uh, uh, Andrew Bauer mentioned about the 20,000 businesses and the £5 per farm for the farming for a better climate. So I, I'd really like to examine some of the, the figures that are in this in the table. I, I, don't, I presume everybody's seen it. There's a presumption that 
uh, there will be a doubling of uh, kilotons per uh, car of uh, carbon dioxide emissions from now until 2017. Uh, and then, and that's mainly, I think, due to fertiliser efficiency measures, if I'm, if I'm correct, and uh, maybe some other developments. But under the proposals, that, uh, by 2018, uh, there would be 260 kilotons carbon dioxide, uh, and by 2020, uh, a further 310 kilotons carbon dioxide. So that would be 12 times the uh, emissions uh, re reduced to what we have. Uh, forecast for for this year. So I, I just wonder if the panel believes that the RPP2 is clear enough how we are actually going to manage to do that and uh, what proposals would probably be needed to, d to develop uh, purely with agriculture uh, to achieve these targets. Any takers on that? Well, okay, Andrew Bauer, please come back. Yeah, I 20,000 farming businesses to convince. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go back to the, my earlier comments about the NVZ Action Programme. Um, I'm sure that the NVZ Action Programme has limited inputs on a good proportion of Scottish farms. Has it won the hearts and minds of those farmers over to the issues of groundwater and nitrates? No, it hasn't. Will some of those who deliver their annual paperwork to Scottish Government be actually doing what it says on the tin? I would have my doubts. Are those in the priority catchments with SEPA where they've been one round to it actually in investing their own money without public subsidy? Yes, they're doing that already. So, yes, if we go for 90% uptake and we make it mandatory, yes, you might on paper drive up the emission savings, but have you actually, you know, if you went out and measured it on the ground, would that translate into the same saving? I don't think it would. I think if you go for the voluntary approach, albeit with, you know, there have to be caveats around that, you know, and, and I say that SEPA does have a regulatory backstop, but you can win people round and you can get actual change rather than paper change. Yes, and, and to add to uh, what Andrew said, I mean, how you, how you get change is by, or certainly voluntary change, is sort of showing rather than telling. So what we, what we try and do and where we've had a bit of a uniqueness within the Farm for a Better Climate programme is having the focus farms. Now, we only have three, sorry, four um, at, at the moment. Um, there could well be an opportunity to extend uh, the network of those focus farms, not necessarily in the same sort of shape or form that they, they are at the moment, but uh, demonstration farms with a particular theme on commercial farms who are, are, have an, a capacity to change in terms of nitrogen efficiency and improvements in nitrogen efficiency and encouraging those in the, in the locality to attend the um, use of the press and other, other mechanisms in order to encourage behavioural change. But actually showing them the benefits um, is a good way of getting, uh, getting change in the industry. Okay. Uh, Robin Matthews. Um, it's not a question, but I, I just wonder if I could ask for a point of clarification on here, because my understanding is that the Farming for a Better Climate um, programme actually already includes nitrogen efficiency measures in it. And I believe the adoption for that is 50% farmers. So the calculations there for the 90% uptake, presumably the difference between 90 and 50, are they, or, or not? I wasn't involved in those calculations, but we do need to make sure that we're not double counting there. Um, if it's already included in FFBC, we shouldn't be counting it uh, in the other one. We can so ask the minister that. That, that. that was part of my point. You know, yeah. what, what is, how, how are we actually getting all this extra uh, fertiliser efficiency measures, um, 260, when at the moment we're, only, we're doing 50 already with, uh, uh, with the FFBC, which they reckon to double to 100. So it's, uh, to me, it's, uh, I'm struggling to see why and how we could actually achieve these figures and just really see, trying to eke out from the, the panel uh, if they understand how that could be done. It seems you, you're struggling to understand also. Uh, well, I haven't been into the figures myself, but I mean, presumably somebody has, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm quite happy to look at them outside the meeting. But, uh, yeah, okay. thanks. Um, Jim Densham wanted to comment just now. Just yeah. quickly, convener, to say that it goes back to my point of earlier that, you know, we need to make sure that farming for better climate and you know, with this measure when it's brought in is, is monitored really well so that we really know 
what is, is happening on, on the ground, not just for the likes of us who are scrutinising, but for government who also need to tell us you know, what is happening so that we can be clear and they can make improvements on that. For those who are waiting for forestry and uh, marine issues, uh, we just keep waiting for a wee moment or two till we finish this, but we will get there. Um, um, first of all, Alec Ferguson wanted to, to chip in just now. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of very conscious that, that all of this demand on, on rural Scotland, if you like, or particularly on the agricultural sector, is going to take place over a period where I think there are going to be that, that there is going to be a huge increasing demand for food security, and, and also. Uh, a hugely increasing demand, worldwide demand for food, full stop, with a rapidly um, increasing world population. And I just wonder whether panel members see those demands as an impediment to achieving these targets, or whether they can actually work successfully hand in hand. Pete uh, Smith. Yeah. I mean, in terms of a real climate <coughs> benefit, I see, see, see them working synergistically. I mean, if if you wanted to cut emissions from agriculture, you would close agriculture down. So we'd get all of our food from elsewhere and we would just displace the emissions that we were currently producing in this country, we would displace them abroad, probably from places that have um, uh, less stringent climate regulations, less stringent fertiliser practice regulations. So it makes no sense at all to, to try and source our food from elsewhere. So we need to maintain a, a, a thriving agricultural industry but to make sure that that is as, as low carbon as we can possibly get in terms of the global climate, not looking at it from Scotland's point of view, but looking at it from the point of the global climate change, then, then doing farming well in this country makes sense. So it, it, it's something that we should continue to do and we should continue to provide food, which will, you know, that feeds into the food security agenda. It helps to our domestic food security with global food security. Um, it means that you know, reducing livestock numbers, for example, or, um, or, or just m contracting our agricultural activity, whilst it would show up well in our, um, our national accounts, which are emissions-based, based, based on, in our land area, that that wouldn't actually provide a net benefit to the, to, to the, to the world. So, so I, I quite agree, the two things need to be done together, and um, a thriving agricultural industry, but with low emissions, is what we should be aiming for. Andrew Bauer. Without wanting to sound like a broken record, I think I would again return to the point about I, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. You get back to the point about sustainable intensification where that is appropriate. It's not appropriate in every part of the country, but it is absolutely appropriate for some areas. And we need to talk to the public and we need to be um, winning over hearts and minds and helping people understand that, okay, you, you may have an idealised vision of how your milk is produced. But if you want us simultaneously to meet our targets on climate change and have a profitable farming sector and various other things, you can't always have everything. You have, there have to be trade-offs here. And I think to some extent the public is in denial. They think they can have the, the, you know, the, the farmer in halfway up a mountain producing food at, at rock bottom prices. They can't have the two. There are, there are a whole sort of set of conflicts here. So the debate has to mature on these issues. But I think it can be done. But we also need the land use policy to step up here and deliver policies that are spatially different. OK. Uh, Alan Hampson and uh, Graham Kerr to finish up this section. I just wanted to flag up that I mean I think it's important that we look at the consumption side of this as well as the production which takes us back into this business about food waste and, and the health agenda as well. Thank you. And uh, Graham? Uh, yeah and just to, to round off I mean the, the examples which are within the RPP2 about the, um, uh, the climate change focus farms um, three of those as stated um, illustrate that the you know the, the implementation of the programme there is actually improved production and um, the only reason why it's um, uh, three out of the four is because one of them is in relation to renewable energy as it's stated there but uh, there has been improvement in production uh, productivity on that farm as well. Good, good information there. Uh, thanks for that. I think we'll try to move on to the forestry section just now and uh, Alec Ferguson is going to lead on that. Um, thank you, Convener. Obviously, woodland and forestry are, are hugely important in reducing Scotland's um, emissions. Um, 
and the main policy laid out in the um, RPP2 proposals, um, or the main policy, sorry, obviously remains the government's planting target. Um, currently, and I think it was Jim Densham mentioned this earlier, the, the current target is 10,000 hectares a year. Um, and that is being replaced in, in RPP2 by um, an overall target of 100,000 hectares by within the next 10 years, which I accept on average is still 10,000 a year. Um, I, I have a concern because 10,000 hectares a year is reasonably easy to monitor and keep an eye on. Um, by bulking it all up over a 10-year period, it, it makes it much harder to just keep an eye on what's happening. And I think that is important because... Uh, young trees soak up far more carbon than older trees, and if you have a dearth of young trees, you are going to affect um, the impact on, on, of, of forestry. So I just wonder if anyone wants to comment on what the rationale is for amending the planting target, um, and indeed whether RPP2 adequately addresses the issue of the lower proportion of uh, young trees in Scotland's forests. And I guess I'm probably looking at Joe here. Yeah, well, um so the, the Wooden Expansion Advisory Group um, looked in quite a lot of detail at the issue of tree planting um, and looked at this target. And I mean, that was the reason why in RPP2, the, um, it, it explains that there'll be a review of the planting target uh, to set rates beyond 2022, because the Wooden Expansion Advisory Group were happy to sign up to a target of 10,000 hectares per year, you know, the ongoing target that's already government policy. Happy to sign up to that for the 10 years, 2012 to 2022, but didn't like the idea of this just sort of continuing ad infinitum. They wanted to really sort of take stock in 2022 and see what the rate should be beyond that. Um, and I, I think the difference between 10,000 a year and 100,000 hectares is really just... Um, I don't think there is a difference. I think it's really to reflect the idea that if, if for some reason planting targets go, uh, planting rates go down in one year, the forestry sector in particular would like to be sure that over the period that average is maintained. So I don't think there's any particular um, difference there. The aim is to continue to plant 10,000 hectares a year um, per year. Uh, and you know, if it went down one year, we'd like to think it could go, be made up a bit in the next year. Um, and, and those annual figures, forgive me, convenient, those annual figures will still Sorry. be publicly available, I take it? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the rate last year was uh, 9,000 hectares a year. The rates have, have been been pushing up towards 10,000 over the last few years. And and uh, I think with the work that the Wooden Expansion Advisory Group did, which has really um, helped to bring the farming and forestry sectors together and to sort of clear the way for um, for a a reasonable planting rate over the coming years. You know, it should be possible to carry on achieving that. Jim Denshaw. Yes, thank you. Um, you said that um, government didn't want the planting targets to go on ad infinitum, but in the back of the RPP document, it's clearly showing that that government is extending that 10,000 hectares um, planting rate and the abatement of that through to 2027. So it seems like in in policy terms in the abatement tables, it is carrying on. So um, we we'll see there's a, there's a disparity there between what is making up abatement figures to achieve an overall target and, and then government saying, we, quite rightly, we need to talk about it and agree it with stakeholders and we need to get consensus. So there's that confusion there. Joel Ellis, yes. I think the, the rate um, has been continued at 10,000 really for calculation purposes in um, but it does say in the, the draft here that it doesn't include projections for either increasing or decreasing that because at this stage we just don't know what would be the right thing to do from um, 2022 onwards. But I think something that Andrew pointed out earlier, the way that RPP, the whole process has brought together the different land use sectors, farming and forestry in particular, um, are seen as, as part of rural land use. They're not two separate sectors working in isolation. And I think... When it comes to doing a review of the rates beyond 2022, um, the farming and forestry sectors will have to work together um, in the light of these ambitious targets, um, stretching targets, to work out how we're going to achieve those. And continuing the woodland creation rate at 10,000 hectares per year could well be a possibility. But I don't think we want to commit to that at this stage because who knows what life will be like um, in 2022. I mean, that's been one of the problems in, over the past. We've had this 
um, government ambition of a 25% um, woodland cover by the middle of the century or the latter half of the century and I just think that long term kind of target is not very helpful it just alienates people so break it down into shorter chunks seems a more helpful way to do it okay. uh, Angus MacDonald question on forestry Yes thank you convener yeah, it's always good to have uh, a high target um, so clearly we need to, to uh, meet the target of um, 100,000 hectares of planting by 2022 and we need to be planting uh, now if we're going to meet, be meeting that target. Um, can I ask what the industry is doing, uh, both the Forestry Commission and the private sector uh, of the industry, uh, to ensure that the target is met? Uh, and is planting being done now with a view to, uh, to ensuring that we get there by uh, 2022? Would that be in terms of nurseries and things? Yeah, like it's, it's, uh, particularly with nurseries, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the forest industry is working hard to achieve um, more woodland creation. I mean, there are grants available and uh, support from the Forestry Commission to, to help achieve 10,000 hectares of woodland creation a year. Um, and that support goes from working with nurseries right through to um, working with the processing sector, which is providing the pull for some of this planting. Andrew Mitchell, yes. Um, yes, there is there is uh, full buy-in to to from the sector to try and uh, meet those targets. The, the key issue is one of um, the continuity of support. So the SRDP plays a critical role in uh, underpinning that meeting those planting targets. But um, one of the artifacts of the of the way that the SRDP works is that that funding is not not stable it kind of goes through cycles and so one of the critical problems in in the immediate future is funding between programs and how how um how that is achievable and the commission is doing um a lot to try and make sure that the the impact of those cycles in funding is is limited so that there is a continuity going forward but there's a great deal of demand so the demand is there it's about marrying those two things up any other points on forestry just now? I have a follow-up question. You? If I may. Certainly. Uh, um, I know there are, I mean, there are other issues in this, like the amount of young trees that are being felled for uh, wind farm development, and, and I know there is meant to be compensatory planting, but to be fair, we've discussed that on the committee, and we probably better stick to general points just now, and I think the, the conveners giving me would confirm that. Um, on, on forestry and RPP2, the, the only proposal that is brought forward is to basically investigate the amount of Scottish timber that's used in the construction sector. And I wonder if anybody here can tell me how, how that is going to be done uh, and taken forward, because I'm not Joe, entirely clear. Joe, sorry, is that you? Um, yeah, uh, what it is is um, you know, timber is, is currently used, of course, in, in construction in Scotland, but um, this proposal is to um, try to um, increase and, and account for that abatement um, by using more Scottish timber in, in construction and refurbishment. So we're working with um, Napier University and other industry partners to develop innovative wood products, um, which can make the best use of Scottish timber, in, particularly in construction. Um, and also trying to work with the planners and building standards and uh, architects and others who, who specify the use of the timber to try and increase the demand for that timber. And this proposal, you know, we're working up to this, should be um, something that can be making a significant contribution from in, in, by the time we get to RPP2. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, finally, a, a question which uh, I want to raise myself with regard to the marine part. There's very little uh, said about the marine sector in the RPP document. Um, and given the time scales of the document, do you think it should include references to concepts such as blue carbon? And what could the policy uh, in this area look like, given that we'll be talking about measuring things like land use agreed throughout the world? Um, is blue carbon something which is ready to be measured? You mentioned seagrasses and um, salt marshes, these sort of things. Could you give us a sort of round on on those areas, please, Rory. Certainly. So, I mean, there is issues around measuring blue carbon and uh, the people working on it are trying to get to the bottom of those. There's been some s substantial progress with the background of the 
uh, UN Framework um, Convention on Climate Change. And so Duke University have done some work <clears throat> looking at how it might be uh, integrated into that programme and how we measure um, how much carbon is sequestered by these habitats. Um, and IUCN have done some excellent work on blue carbon as well. So there is a background um, and there is a starting point. Whether it's at a stage where it can be fully considered within the RPP2 is another matter, but it should at least be accounted for or recognised as somewhere that requires further development and somewhere for further action, really. Um, in terms of, sort of other marine matters within the RPP, I think um, you're right. I mean, there's, there's obvious gaps. I mean, I looked through it in the sort of maritime transport and a little bit about marine renewable energy. And that's it, really, which is quite unusual when you consider the impacts of climate change. The reason for doing any of this stuff in the first place are being most keenly felt in the marine environment right now. I won't go into all that. I think my colleague gave you a very eloquent um, story on that uh, when he was in front of the Biodiversity Committee last week. But just to attach some figures to that, in Noss, Cliffs and Shetland, kitty wakes, which are top of the marine food chain and impacted heavily by um, climate change, I've seen a 95% decline since 1980. So back then there was 11,000 pairs, now there's 507 pairs. This is catastrophic for some of these species. So it's happening. Climate change is having an effect now, which puts renewed urgency behind the RPP2 being effective and putting concrete measures in place. Now, one of the areas that's obviously had the, the most uh, political drive and interest behind it thus far has been energy generation and decarbonising our energy supply. And that's critical, obviously, and we're very supportive of measures to, uh, for, a, for a more renewable energy supply and to move into renewable energy. Um, but we do need to focus on these other areas, uh, housing, land use, energy efficiency, and get that real kind of drive behind those sectors as well. Um, but in the rollout of marine renewable energy, we need to make sure this happens sustainably. And in fact, there's a duty to do that within the Climate Change Act. Uh, and we're coming to a, a, a situation where we've got the Marine Scotland Act now, which is fantastic. We've got marine protected areas dropping out of that, a duty to designate those. There are the Birds and Habitats Directives from Europe, which give us um, legal duties to designate protected areas at sea for birds and, and other species and habitats. Um, and we've also got, of course, things like environmental impact assessment directives. These are all critical to making sure that that's rolled out sustainably. Now, unfortunately, um, we don't have our guiding documents so far. We don't have the National Marine Plan yet. There's been delays to that. And it's really critical that that comes forward as soon as possible so we have a strategic plan-led process. And actually, that's largely happened on land with the development of wind energy. So we've managed to avoid sensitive areas. It's trickier at sea because on top of not having a plan, we also do not have uh, protected areas for seabirds, offshore foraging sites designated. There's none at all. Uh, there's no designation of sites for things like harbour porpoise, for which we've had the le legislation for, a, for some amount of time. And the marine protected area proposals, in, in our belief, are, are not ambitious enough and, and don't really go far enough um, to protect things like seabirds and, and, and look at recovery of marine habitats, which are in a beleaguered state, according to Scotland's Marine Atlas. So really we need to, to give certainty to the, marine, to the marine renewable energy sector and to allow these targets in the R RPP to be achieved, we need to make sure we get environmental protection right to ensure that industry rolls out on a sustainable basis and other industries of course as well. Um, and the plan is all about having a level footing across all those areas, including things like carbon capture and storage, which you know, if, if the ideas are correct, that's going to be stored uh, at sea in, in, in some of these spent. Uh, uh, parts of, of, of the strata. So that would be my main plea, is that there's linkages to the Marine Act, the importance of, of, of marine planning and having a plan-led approach um, and making sure that we follow that and making sure we get environmental protection right and that there's renewed urgency behind ensuring we've got protected areas in place to make sure that we don't cause damage to the marine environment in, in the cause of trying to save the environment. Thank you very much for that, that summary. We'll add it to our considerations and to questions for the Minister. I'd like to thank the panel just now uh, for what has been a highly informative se uh, session for us. Um, we're going to change over a five-minute break just now to do so. Uh, I know that people like to chat afterwards, but we'd like to also try and get on. So thank you all very much for your contributions.
And uh, we welcome uh, our new panel just now. So um, this is um, the second panel on uh, the Low Carbon Scotland meeting our emissions reduction targets 2013 to 27. Uh, and um, we're talking about the uh, need to uh, 
have the witnesses explain who they are and look at evidence on the themes of behaviour change, resource use and the scope for technical innovation across RPP2. So in terms of going round the table, I'm the convener, Rob Gibson, MSP. I think you're the first after the officials. Great. I'm Morag Watson. I'm Senior Policy Officer with WWS Scotland and I lead on our work relating to behaviour change and climate change. Thank you. I'm um, Stuart Fraser. I'm the Technical Director of the William Tracy Group, it's a Resource Recovery and Recycling Group, uh, and also sit on the Waste and Resources Subcommittee of the 2020 Group. I'm Claudia Beamish, uh, MSP for South Scotland and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Andy Kerr, Director of, uh, Executive Director of the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation and also a member of the 2020 Climate Group. Um, Linda Ovens, representing the Chartered Institution of Wastes Management and the co-author of the Carbon Metric for Recycling um, in the report. Richard Lyle, MSP Central Region. Nigel Vaughan, MSP Angus North and Mearns. I'm Claire Baker, MSP. Uh, I'm James Curran, Chief Executive of uh, SEPA. Uh, I'm also currently the, the, the sole external on the Emissions Reduction Programme Board uh, and on the main board of the 2020 Group. Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. I'm Simon Pepper. I'm a member of the Climate uh, 2020 group and I'm a retiring chairman of the Climate Challenge Fund panel. Uh, Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Uh, I'm Mike Brompton. I'm the chief exec of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. I'm on the board of Stock Climate Care Scotland, the board of Environment Link. I uh, sit on the 2020 main group and retiring panel member of the Climate Challenge Fund. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East and PLO to the Cabinet Secretary and the Environment Minister. Uh, Mike Bonaventura, Chief Executive of the Crichton Carbon Centre. Uh, we focus on the non-traded sector and climate justice. I'm Graham Day, I'm the MSP for Angus South and the Deputy Convener of the Committee. Um, if you wish to speak, um, just indicate to us and we'll have a list here as we go through. Um, and the sound is dealt with automatically by, uh, so you don't have to switch anything on or off yourselves. Right, we've been trying to tease out at the beginning the comparison between RPP1 and RPP2 and the effectiveness of that link. Um, do the panel members feel that RPP1 has to date been effective and given a satisfactory policy framework to drive down emissions in their sector. Who wants to start? Okay, the next question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, Mike Robinson, sorry. Uh, just to get the ball rolling. Um, no, not really. Um, it has had its moments, and there's, there's positives in there, but I think that the, the RPP1, one of the things I think has been difficult, actually, is translating that uh, to groups to adopt. I think it's actually been very difficult to understand some of the detail of what's required to help deliver carbon reductions. And uh, I think that's perpetuated in the RPP2, which, uh, to some extent, in certain areas anyway, has actually put the effort back further than the RPP1 did. Okay, and uh, we'll come to the recognition factors about the effort um, in due course. Uh, first of all, we've got James Curran. Yeah, I mean, looking back at RPP1, I suppose one, one thing definite you can say about it is that we missed the first annual target for 2010. Um, which isn't a great start because you then need to make that up uh, and also start meeting the future targets. So you're, you're, you're kind of uh, hindered uh, going into the future. And I think for me that the lessons from RPP1 need to be about uh, developing uh, surrogate measures so that we can do real-time monitoring of how we're progressing uh, because the, the carbon assessment for Scotland is published virtually two years uh, after, uh, which isn't a very good way to be running a program. You need to be monitoring in real time to know how you're doing. And, and I think the, the, the second element is in, in terms of uh, future delivery. Um, RPP2 is a good document, it has a lot to say, um, technically excellent, but for me it says very, very little about how we're actually going to set around putting in a governance package that will ensure delivery. Um, Andy Kerr? Yeah, I think I would 
I would concur with what has just been said. I think the RPP2, uh, sorry, RPP1 uh, was very much a, a collection of um, policies and proposals for each of the different sectors, some of which were very good, some of which were less good. And you didn't get a sense from there that, that it was going to get translated into a delivery action plan. And I think what we were looking for, I was looking for from RPP2, was a bit more coherence about how you actually turn what are some potentially very, very good ideas. And there is a fantastic amount of activity actually going on, but turning that into a coherent framework within which we can manage and monitor what is going on and to know what the plan Bs are when plan A doesn't work, as it invariably won't in different parts. Um, the engagement of the panel members to some extent in some of that activity which is going on uh, presumably must be quite considerable uh, given the carbon uh, exchange and things like that, the climate exchange and, and, and bodies like that. But have panel members been um, engaged in uh, assessing the, in the development of the RPP2 directly? Andy? Um, again, I, I, I didn't mention, but I'm also policy director of climate exchange. So yes, um, I, I have been heavily. We have been heavily involved through that for, forum, and that was. Uh, I'm not sure if it was covered in the, in the first session, but it was very much an attempt by the Scottish government and the civil servants to ensure that they had best access to the best information from across the research base. Actually, not just within Scotland, but actually more broadly. Um, and so that we are making a, doing a lot of work in that space to try and support both policy development, but also the understanding around policy implementation. Other panel members? Uh, Simon Pepper. Uh, yes, I, I and uh, um, others were involved um, uh, as consultees uh, with Scottish Government officials on the um, behaviour change aspects. Um, having said that, um, the, the, the addendum to RPP2 on behaviour change won't be published until the end of this month. So it's difficult to report on whether our input has been adequately um, uh, in, in, in included in that. I think our concern about the behaviour side of things is that there should be, I say our concern, and it's shared by several of the other consultees, um, was that uh, there really needs to be a strong effort to integrate behaviour change programmes and activities with the other aspects of RPP2, so that you see a line-up between uh, the, the, the material changes, the, the, the big policy levers that are being pulled on the one hand, and the efforts to engage the, uh, the relevant uh, audiences, the public, the market, and so on, on the other. Perhaps we're coming to that, Chair. We will be coming to the behaviour change bit specifically as a topic, but uh, you pointed us in that direction. Um, uh, Morag Watson wants to say something just now. Uh, I would concur with Simon that there has been some very good collaborative work with the Scottish Government, uh, particularly up until 30th of August last year with a large conference on that particular topic. What is in the RPP does reflect that consultation and we would all be very supportive of it. But subsequent to that and the actual development of the RPP itself, to my knowledge, uh, certainly WWF has not been involved in the behaviour change section, and I'm not aware of other people who have been particularly involved in the writing of it. And uh, Professor uh, Bonaventure. Um, to pick up on some of the behaviour change aspects, we've been involved in consulting around um, <clears throat> various uh, impact assessments associated with RPP2. Um, some of those are, uh, I suppose the best way to think about it is, is that there are three primary target groups. There's a household group, a private sector, and a public sector. And the impacts of RPP2 across the piece on each of those target groups varies considerably. So for example, the uh, understanding of impacts on households is very well understood. Uh, less well understood is the impact on the private sector and in our view the uh, the impacts on the public sector is even less well understood so I think there's a, a, a differential that needs to be considered there. Um, panel members, you know, when considering RPP2, will it be effective overall in uh, meeting annual emissions targets? And how appropriate are the timescales within the document? in general. James 
Gun? It, it relates to a, a comment as well. I just wanted maybe to, to make on the back of the, the previous question as regards the, the, the level of engagement, uh, which I think has generally been very good. But I think some of the debate has been kind of set within um, constraints or within parameters that, that maybe in, in retrospect um, haven't been helpful. I mean, it seems to me if you look at the, the trajectory uh, for the policies and proposals in RPP2, they, if we're lucky, just about meet the targets most years. Uh, for me, uh, there is no headroom built in there. Uh, and if you, you, you want to meet targets, obviously you need to plan to have a bit of headroom because we all know that things don't go quite as we expect. It seems to me one way of building that headroom in would have been to have developed RPP2, perhaps with a longer time scale in mind. We know we have an 80% target uh, further down the track. The, the, there are perhaps actions, activities that you would begin to undertake within this period of RPP2 that would lead towards uh, the later target that would be no regrets activities, take us in the right direction, and also give a bit of headroom. Now, uh, from the earlier discussion this morning, some of those may, may be costly, um, but we've got to look at cost of those activities in terms of the wider benefits, and that often isn't addressed because they're hard to monetize. Uh, but overall, the, for the, the, the figures I take out of it is that the Scottish Government spend under our PP2 is around about 0.3% of GDP. That doesn't include private sector spend, of course. Uh, Stern has uh, indicated earlier that it should, we should be spending around about 1% of GDP, and lately it revised that upwards to 2% because we we haven't been taking sufficient action in the interim. So I think all of these kind of contextual issues would perhaps have developed a more robust uh, RPP2 with, with a longer term focus uh, embedding a bit of extra headroom, which would have meant we'd have been more likely to meet the targets each and every year into the future. Okay. Um, Claire Baker. Thank you, Convener. I suppose the point actually falls on from uh, what James Curran has contributed. And it was to ask the panel, there seemed to be quite positive about the degree of engagement there has been in preparing the document. But is this reflected? Do they have any concerns that the debate has not been broad enough? The continual criticism of the document is that it doesn't contain actual policies. It has plenty of proposals, but no actual policies. Now, in terms of, this, of the stakeholders, who, when, when I speak to stakeholders, they're quite clear about some of the policy areas they believe should be in the document. Is there any frustration that there's maybe not enough debate over some of the more difficult choices that have to be made? Um, there's criticism that the document seems quite vague. Um, so while there has been contribution, do you feel it's actually reflected in a proper framework for how these targets can be met? Simon Pepper? Um, yes. I'd like to just mention, in, uh, to add, add to the point that I made earlier about in, involvement, um, some of us were involved in uh, consultation about the behaviour change side of it. Um, some of us also on the Climate uh, 2020 group were involved in a one-day uh, workshop um, of consultation about the structure of RPP2 also. Uh, but I think it was... That was very limited, and as far as I know, there hasn't been any wider consultation of, of wider networks, and that's a little bit of a concern, especially in the light of what members just said, um, because I think the aspiration was that there should be quite considerable amount of consultation and uh, involvement of wider uh, interest groups in the, in the uh, construction of this, and it's important that it should for reasons of wider engagement once the policies are being implemented. Would it be the case that other people want to comment? Uh, Andy Kerr? Just, I mean, just to come back to your point, I think um, what I was hoping to see from RPP2, as you've described, is much more explicit delineation of, you know, what is it the bits that the EU is going to deliver? What are the bits the UK government policy is going to deliver? What are the UK, what are the Scottish going to do, uh, policies going to do, and where do we need to rely on local authorities to deliver particular output, outcomes, where is the private sector and so on. So actually that delineation of who is actually going to create the emission reduction over the next few years wasn't as clear in this as it could have been, but the overall context, particularly in, in um, 
Section 3 was very good because it flagged some of these different issues and some of the pressures which make it very difficult to measure, for example, the costs of what might happen in 2025. Is, you know, that's a stab in the dark at the best of times. So I think there are good parts to this, but what it hasn't done is land it, is pin it down in the way that I would have liked to have seen it. Yes. I think particularly in probably the other area has been the concerns about it being quite, um, there not being enough front loading, that a lot of the activity where the real progress has been made are in future years rather than actually what happens in the next two or three, four, five years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also that they're very, again, they are very general statements about this is what we hope to happen rather than specific statements about this is what we need to have done to make this happen. So we may not know the numbers exactly. We know, may not be able to quantify it or put it into cash terms exactly, but at least we have a, 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 a framework, whereas this still looks like a set of policies and proposals that are just being pushed out there without, a, if you like, a, a way of landing it. Um, so I, I think there is a concern there, yeah. Mike Robinson? Yes. First of all, I do think um, that there is a concern about uh, it not being very front-loaded and not taking enough early action. I think that's true. Um, in terms of that, uh, the consultation question, that's quite difficult to answer because if people were consulted, it's difficult to know whether other people were. Um, but certainly my sense is because there's a, there's, um, uh, there's a little bit of wishful thinking in there post-2020 rather than some sort of definitive uh, action ahead of that period, and because of that, there's a lack of detail, which then makes that consultation process slightly difficult. And I, I agree with what Andy's saying, a delineation of who can do what to help achieve each of these areas, I think, is missing. And for me, that's very obviously looking at the different facets of delivery. So Scottish Government, local authority, community delivery, third sector, business. Um, and certainly within the 2020, we were involved in the pre-Christmas consultation exercise. Um, but there is still a sense that without that detail, business isn't quite sure how it can help deliver what's in here. So it does, that, that's the danger in having things that are a little bit too vague. Okay. Um, just following on that point a bit, um, given the limited powers that the Scottish Government has in quite a number of sectors, um, we've got to think about whether the RPP2 uh, can represent best value. Um, and whether uh, the panel can comment on where the costs appear to fall. So best value is something which we're concerned about, you know, generally as a, a concern of government. Uh, <coughs> I mean, one issue that, that has been flagged earlier is that um, many of the proposals in here, they've had a stab at quantifying the, the, the cash, the financial impact, but actually many of them have much broader social and economic impacts, uh, and some are negative, some are positive, and what it doesn't do is capture a lot of those. Now, let's not kid ourselves, they're really difficult to capture, they're not, you know, this is not something you can do easily. But actually, for example, looking at transport issues and relating it to health in cities, we know about air pollution in cities, um, looking at the transformation that we're expected to see with transport, with electric cars or hybrid cars and so on, th this doesn't really come out. So it's very difficult then to judge or to allow other people and assessors to judge the value of these policies in a broader context of best value, which isn't just pure financial input from the Scottish Government, or indeed financial input from the businesses, but actually is a broad ass assessment of what is the value to Scotland of delivering these policies. And I think that's a real, it's a, it's a very challenging area, but it's a challenge that needs to be done. Hoping that the Infrastructure Committee will be uh, digging into these particular issues, you know, from our point of view. Although we have an overview, we've got specific uh, areas of resources and land use and things like that, particularly that we're coming on to. James Curran? Yeah, again, I think it reflects back to, to some of the earlier discussion that um, you know, I'm a great believer in, in, in telling uh, individuals or, or business sectors or, or components of civic society precisely what their uh, responsibilities should be in this area uh, and give them the task then of, of delivering it, uh, reporting it, monitoring it, delivering it, but also probably working out uh, this 
extreme level of detail that is being referred to, which is verging on the impossible, I think, in a kind of a national document like this. But And, and Andy's uh, uh, example of uh, urban air pollution is a very, very good one, a, a classic one in terms of the multiple benefits that are derived from improving uh, city air quality, um, because the solution is all about public transport, which reduces emissions, and then there are knock-on effects in terms of uh, human health, amenity value, uh, location of businesses, and, and so on and so forth. Very hard to capture those. But you can make an attempt to capture those uh, those costs. I mean, the, the, the whole program of RPP2 is, is costed at 1.6 billion, and the benefits in there are, are, are noted as 1.2 billion. That, that, to me, is a completely unfair comparison. Uh, it shouldn't really be, be, be considered at all, because it's not capturing many of these very significant multiple benefits that as a society in Scotland we would all want to pursue anyway. But it, to me it comes back to that governance issue about giving the responsibility and giving the authority and giving the delivery target to sectors of civic society to get on and, and, and do. Um, and on the back of that they can then start doing these calculations. And to me, again referring back to the fact that we have an 80% target in the future, it's not really about uh, the cost uh, it, it's about the scheduling of the cost. What do we do early? What do we do late? We know that the, the change to reach an 80% target is truly, deeply transformational. Um, uh, Mike uh, Benefit-Ventura. Um, yes, thank you, convener. The, the idea of, of benefits that exist across Scottish society, I think, needs some... Um, uh, finer grain analysis really in as much as <clears throat> some of the economic benefits that are going to accrue for example to the east coast as a result of offshore wind um, are not going to accrue to the west coast for offshore wind so there are uh, distributional impacts of policies individually and cumulatively uh, across the the country and to think of benefits to Scottish society as a whole is fine, but there needs to be a, a finer grain understanding of how that's going to impact uh, local economic development plans as well. Okay. Anyone else on this point about base value just now? Just, yep. just one, one final point, um, which is again that there, there has been a tendency to think that this you know, this, because this document is a national document by the government, that the government has to spend lots of money to deliver on it. And uh, I think we've talked about this before, but it is very much about can you create the conditions by which you can also encourage private investment into this space? Because there are huge opportunities um, to deliver fairly radical change. There are growing markets around the world in this space. And actually what we're looking for is, a, is an entrepreneurial setup in Scotland. We have a lot of the attributes we need to actually in, in, encourage private investment into this space so it's not seen to be simply coming out of the public purse. And I think that's just it's something to keep in mind when we're thinking about best value. So. I mean, I, I, just a follow-on question to that. I mean, this discussion about well-being as a measure, you know, obviously, as a more holistic measure of uh, this. Can you get business to buy into, the, you know, contributing to a, any well-being measure which is not just monetized? I don't, think will, I don't think you can get them to buy in in the sense of saying we'll invest for the sake of well-being, but I think where you have well-being, businesses will locate there because they actually see the benefits to their staff and otherwise. So I think it's actually the other way around. Where there are locations where there is a good quality of life, you will actually get businesses wanting to be in that space, which will actually create a, a virtuous circle. So, so I think they see the value in it, whether they will commit money to support it beyond saying that's where we want to be i i, I, I don't know i'm a little bit skeptical but on the other hand if you can create these these hubs of of of, of well-being in different and, and the cities are are the major players here but equally there are some fantastic examples within the rural regions where you can get this this virtuous circle then i think you can get a, a lot of support in that space well this is an appropriate time then to look at behavior change to try and achieve some of these things graham day Thank you, Convener. Um, 
What do the panel members feel needs to be included in the Scottish Government Low Carbon Scotland Behaviours Framework, which as we know is due to be published at the end of this month? And beyond that, in, in seeking to secure behavioural change, what should be the role for large membership organisations such as WWF and Stop Climate Chaos? Should it simply be to seek to um, influence government policy, or should it be to be proactive in helping encourage behavioural change, say at an individual level? Mike? Feels like I have to answer that one. <laughs> um, it's slightly, again, pin, comes back to the previous question in terms of um, best value. I mean, I think there's different, different ways to deliver some of this. I do think that one of the things that needs uh, articulated better, perhaps, is uh, clarity of vision here um, so that people are absolutely clear what they're buying into, what they've been asked to do. Um, because actually I think that uh, there's creative ways to bring that behaviour change about. Um, I don't think civil society for a minute thinks it hasn't got a role to play in helping to both articulate and communicate that. Um, it's part of responsible behaviour as an organisation. Um, but equally I think that what we haven't quite managed to do yet is get all the different parts of society to work towards the same aims. Um, there's some communities are doing good things, but it's not very strategic. Um, some businesses, there's a lot of willingness, but actually, to be honest, within the 2020, I think there's a sense of needing more direction, um, and that therefore, actually, everybody's sort of looking to everybody else for a bit of direction. So, uh, for me, one of the answers here is there just needs to be some sort of certainty around the sort of key um, changes we're seeking. And then I think everybody's got a role to play, and I think that is the Scottish Government clearly only has so many levers. Local authorities have a big role to play. Um, businesses have their role to play, and they will do it for corporate social responsibility reasons and the goodwill of their staff and, their, and the, the benefit of their staff as much as any other reason. Um, but third sector, the whole of the third sector has a very important role to play. And one I don't think we should overlook, they have vast networks of members. They have their own um, communication media. Uh, and they're trusted by their members. And uh, that's actually a very important uh, aspect of putting across some of this communication. Not that MSPs aren't trusted by large numbers of people who voted for them, uh, which are probably more than even the membership of uh, some uh, pressure groups. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, we, between us, we should be able to get to quite a lot of people. Yeah. Um, Morag Watson first and then Linda Ovens. I should maybe <coughs> answer this one as well. Um, with regard to your question about what would we want to see in the behaviours change framework, as Simon has already mentioned, it is regretful that we, we don't have it to look at at the moment and it will be out in a month's time, so it's very hard to make a judgement on what would actually be in there. What we would be looking to see is actually some firm policies and proposals, because although what's in the RPP2 in the behaviour change section is very good. It sets out some excellent principles. It really does reflect the latest behaviour change research and we'd be very supportive of it. There is no detail about how that will be taken forward. So we would be expecting to see the detail in the um, framework. Specific things that we'd be wanting to see are actions around particularly home energy use and transport. We know from the research that if you put behaviour change activities around something in the infrastructure section, for example, the rollout of smart meters, you can get your energy savings to go from around about 5% up to 25%. So that's the specifics of what we'd be looking for. We'd also be looking to see that the government would actually be doing some work of its own on its own communications and documentation around climate change. Um, an example of this is the uh, Greener Scotland website. It's a very good example of a government communication incorporating the latest behaviour change research. Unfortunately, I would have to say the RPP2 document itself <coughs> sadly does not seem to have taken into account this research and the current language in which it's written, the research would indicate is not helpful for supporting um, particular behaviour change and action on it. With regard to the role of the NGO sector and the third sector, I would agree with what Mike has said. Um, 
We have a collective partnership approach in Scotland which has worked very well in this area. WWF, for example, has led a lot on the development of research and practice around behaviour change and we have always sought to work in partnership with government, with other statutory bodies and with other civil society organisations. And this is what we found to be most effective. So in terms of our role, I would say it continues to be partnership and innovation and the bringing of our collective strengths together with others. Linda Evans and then Simon. Thank you. From a, from a waste and resources point of view, then um, we've seen significant change in behaviour um, in terms of, of recycling behaviour over the last 10 years. Um, and I think that that is likely to continue. So we're, we're coming from the bottom up rather than, than the other way around. And um, the challenge for us now is, is, that, is continuing that behaviour change into business and especially SMEs and, uh, and larger sectors. Um, in terms of what we're, we're doing and what can be done, then significant effort is being put into these sectors at the moment and that should continue. And, and what we see from RPP2 is that it supports um, other policies um, that, are, that are, are moving forward already in this area and, and keeps the momentum of change going um, from, from the bottom-up approach. Um, in terms of document as a whole from Waste and Resource, um, then we are, the, the, the change in the industry is, is towards um, a reduction in consumption and um, resource management. So, so the chapter itself is, 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 is not as significant as it, as it once was. Um, and that waste and resources is, is supporting the other chapters within RPP2 rather than being a, a, an item in its own right. Simon Pepper. Um, yes, in, in answer to your question about um, what, what would we want to see, uh, I think, um, first of all, I'd support the comments made about the quality of what's in there at present in terms of the way it articulates the principles and the uh, lessons that we've learned from research, which to its credit has been done by Scottish Government in a, in a very competent way about behaviour change. I think the, the three points that I would want to make about what, what, what should be in there once we see more of the detail is, is firstly um, a question of emphasis, really. Um, there are 10 pages uh, allocated to this topic in the RPP2. Um, what, what we don't really get from that is the importance, the relative importance of this area of, of, of endeavour in relation to all the other things. The point being that many of the other areas uh, to do with energy and food and transport and so on, they're only going to really work in implementation terms once the public, the wider public, the customers, the voters and others are properly engaged and committed to it in attitude terms. So there is a need for real emphasis to be given to the sort of integrative potential of um, behaviour change. I think one of the problems, actually, is the, 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 the label behaviour change, because it tends to focus the mind on individual ac action, whereas in strategic terms, we need to concentrate on societal attitudes and norms. And so I like to think of it more as culture change. And if we think about the, the uh, uh, challenge that we've got in achieving culture change, we need to look at how now we regard what to some of us in our shameful youths was quite familiar, you know, attitudes that we now regard as quite shocking about drink driving, for example, or smoking in company or in airplanes or in close quarters with others who don't like it, or, you know, the seatbelt uh, story and so on. These are now adopted into social norms. Behaviour is much more responsible these days, and we need to create a situation as soon as possible where we're moving towards... Uh, and, uh, uh, prevailing attitudes in the 2020s, 2030s, where we would regard current, present-day habits as completely unacceptable and irresponsible. And it's that level of ambition which needs to be in there, but I don't see it. So that's my first point. Secondly, it's about integration. I will be quick. Um, it's about integration. Um, what we know about behaviour change or culture change generally is that the really important thing is to have all the signals lined up where there are perversities, where government is saying one thing and doing another, people lose trust straight away, and if they see confusing signals, they'll carry on doing what they were before. There really needs to be an effort to get these lined up, and to do so by means of uh, the mechanism which has been referred to by others of getting the different sectors to play to their strengths. 
government is very good at pulling big levers. It's not very good at influencing individual behavior. There are other mechanisms in society. There are other social networks and so on, which are very good at that, but not good at pulling the big levers. And I would like to see much more evidence of creative partnerships which can really deliver by working together at using these different strengths. Uh, and, and the example of recycling um, that uh, Linda made is, is a really excellent, real beautiful case study of how by lining up all these different influences on people, you can achieve really significant culture change within a generation. And the final thing is we need to see all of this, need to promote all of this as opportunity not as a challenge which is likely to defeat us unless we try really hard. This is a change which needs to be led from the front by ministers as a vision of a better Scotland and a better place to live and a better environment for people to enjoy better health, better well-being, and, let's face it, to save money. That shouldn't be the leading issue, but saving money should be a part of that whole argument. And there's lots of opportunity to present as uh, grounds for arguing for all of these things to be, to be happening, not as a challenge which is going to defeat us, but as an opportunity that we've got to grasp because the window is quite small. Uh, Aaron, uh, Simon's been very eloquent and I, I'm going to say rather the same things, but I'll say them only to back up very strongly what, what Simon said. Three elements occurred to me as well. Um, sorry? Don't cover the same ground. No, no, no. But um, I, I'm proud to live, live in Scotland, which does have the, the world leading legislation on climate change. Uh, but I think now there's an obligation on us to absolutely deliver on that. Otherwise, we will be a, a poor exemplar to the rest of the world rather than a, a good exemplar. So I think uh, the, the, the whole of this um, uh, effort that we're involved in needs to be presented as Scotland's challenge. And I'll give credit to Scottish Parliament here, all, all of you in the room. I, at least my perception is that there is very good cross-party support uh, to the efforts that Scotland's making in climate change. To me, that demonstrates a high degree of leadership straight away. We should really be building on that. This is Scotland's challenge. It's a challenge to every single one of us uh, to contribute what we can and to drive the multiple benefits, just as, as uh, uh, Simon said. We, we should present it as us being a world leader in delivery as well as in aspiration. For me, a, an important aspect that perhaps hasn't come out so much in any other comments so far is the element of ethics and morality around this, linking climate change to the poor and the underprivileged both in this country and around the world. Uh, WWF, I think, has done some exemplary work in behaviour change and indicating and, and creating, for me anyway, very persuasive evidence that you only get lasting and significant behavioural change if it is based on ethics and morality. And I think as, as, as government, uh, as public bodies even, we need to start getting involved in that, that ethic and morality argument, which is sometimes difficult for us. And finally, it relates to some of the other elements about uh, volunteering. Uh, getting all of us across the country to volunteer more, particularly environment, uh, environmental volunteering, providing the information, we call it citizen science in SEPA, the use of Scotland's environment web and so on, to encourage people to understand the environment, and through that they will become a custodian and a safeguard for that environment. And there's lots of evidence that that kind of volunteering actually stimulates uh, entrepreneurial behaviours, uh, uh, stronger, uh, uh, more resilient communities as well. So again, multiple benefits all the way down the line. Um, Mike uh, Bonaventura. Um, yes, thank you, Convener. Um, the the uh, behaviour change framework alluded to in RPP2 includes, for example, uh, engagement with values and frames, the, the common cause, which is fine. Um, but there are personal preferences and styles of, of engaging. And, and I'd like to see in there something that on the one hand recognises that there are differences which are uh, based in socio-economic circumstance, for example. Um, I recognise uh, what Simon was saying about the link between the individual and the uh, broader cultural change. And it's always struck me as kind of bizarre that um, engagement with and through the cultural sector seems to be missing. 
So, I mean, I, I don't know how many people around this table, for example, have a, a background in, in arts or humanities. <clears throat> I suspect very few, most of us come at this from a social science or a natural or a physical sciences point of view. And that's something that the bulk of the public disengage with about the age of, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, when uh, uh, going through the hormonal changes to adulthood um, and never really pick up again. So I, I think engagement that takes account of the fact that people can uh, are, are rather more open to visual arts, performing arts, conceptual arts, music, um, all of those things should be brought to bear as, as ways of, of improving public engagement. Mike, Mike Robinson, and then there's some questions to follow. Yeah. Yep, sorry, okay, first of all, um, I think it's important to recognise, I mean, I would like to see within this uh, clarification of how behaviour change can actually help underpin all the areas that um, we're seeking to see change. Uh, secondly, that there are a recognition, actually, that there are one or two areas of um, climate change delivery that are more suited to behaviour change, and the obvious ones are transport and housing, but there are others. But perhaps a sort of recognition that that actually is the key areas in which where behaviour change is going to be one of the bigger levers, uh, rather than necessarily purely legislative. Um, I'd like to see more milestones and policies within it, um, and also just this issue about identifying and coordinating all the levers, but facilitating others to do some of that job for you. It doesn't, it's not incumbent on Scottish Government to have to go away in a dark room and come up with a, an advert. It, it is, there's a lot of different uh, groups out there that can be used to help deliver this. Or we come back to Graham. Uh, yes, indeed, Stuart Fraser. Yeah, just point on the, on the point's been well made. Recycling has been uh, very successful in achieving behaviour change. Uh, and that needs to be maintained because we've done the low-hanging fruit. We're now getting into the harder-to-reach areas. But I think there also needs to be a stronger message of support for energy from waste when we've, we've recycled and recovered as many materials as possible. Um, there's still a perception amongst the general public that uh, energy recovery is a very contentious and difficult issue. Uh, and it leads to a lot of opposition to facilities, which we will need uh, to deliver our, our uh, complete landfill diversion targets. So I think there needs to be a stronger message on that. Uh, not diluting or taking away from the recycling message, but complementary to it. Okay, a contentious area there for, for many people. Um, first of all, Claudia wanted to ask a question supplementary to this. Please do. Thank you, Convener. Uh, in relation to the, the vision that people around the table are talking about in relation to behaviour change and the, the ideas that are coming forward that it should be threaded through the different sectors, um, there's obviously a role for Scottish Government in this uh, in terms of funding, and I wonder if there are areas where, particularly perhaps in, in relation to the social aspect of, of people on low incomes, whether there are ways um, in which the behaviour change can be supported by Scottish Government in, in new funding or additional funding that could then enable uh, people and partners to work together in their communities, business and in, in, um, in the third sector. Is that a comment or, well, there's a response there and we'll come to clear in a minute. Yes, in answer to Claudia's question, uh, I think um, one area where very creditable uh, investment has been made is in the Climate Challenge Fund, which is uh, 10 million plus pounds a year going into support for communities. And there is now a discriminatory sort of search in, in, in its work in marketing the opportunities of the fund in areas of multiple deprivation. So that is one option, and I think it shouldn't stand alone because drawing from the experience of that, there are lessons about how to engage people effectively more widely, not just in further applications to the fund, but in other networks. And there's a role for uh, the, the um, sort of communities of interest in this, which perhaps has been, well, I think almost definitely has been underplayed so far, Groupings like church groupings, sports associations, all sorts of what you might call extracurricular activities at a community level or at a national level involving particular interests can be very effective in, in uh, encouraging people to adopt different um, behaviour patterns and lifestyles. And uh, there is 
undoubtedly potential for their lifting from some of the experience of community groups. Andy, care. Just, um, again, just focusing on that very specific question, I think a lot of this document inevitably has focused on how do you get the policy framework and how do you ensure you've got the financing behind it? And I think that, that, that what has been made aware over the last two or three years, three or four years, is that the thing that has been often missing is what you might call human capital or the social capital, which is the bit that actually glues it all together at a community level or at a, a, a between businesses and communities. And again, there is a sense, I think, that the Scottish Government could, and they are already starting to support that, it doesn't involve a huge amount of money because actually what you're doing is leveraging the talent that is already there, but it does need something to glue it together, to stick it together. So I think that is an important element that the, that the government could run with. And, and I think it's fair to say they recognise that and they are looking at this because we have had a whole series of policies where the framework has been set up, the money's been made available, and then nothing's happened. And the question is, why not? And the answer is because you haven't necessarily had the capacity within communities, urban communities, rural communities, to make those things actually happen or, or within the businesses that are working with them. So I think that is actually a really, it's a good question, it's a really important area, um, which doesn't involve a huge amount of money, but the outcome should be very positive on the back of that. Nick Robinson. Again, I mean, again, I think it's an area where some of the lack of clarity within the LPP2 doesn't help. Um, there are, ideally, that would form the blueprint that you would then present to each of the different sectors. I mean, um, Climate Challenge Fund has achieved a certain amount of things and has done, you know, it's been a good source of income to some communities to allow them to develop schemes. But the reality is that that doesn't necessarily fall from a strategic position. And so, um, actually, I think that there is a number of areas where more more detail would help to inform that process and actually would help to shape the way that funding is allocated. And it should support those bigger visions. I mean, there are other sectors that I just, you know, if you're putting money behind it, that's going to happen. I think the problem with climate change is it affects everybody, but it's something, uh, you know, it's one of the things that affects everybody. So everybody's got it, but not a lot of people have got it as the main thing. And uh, actually, therefore, it suffers a little bit because of that. And I do think putting some funding behind all of the different sectoral groups is critical. Local authorities, um, some of the third sector agencies and communities again, but with a bit more um, of a you know, bit more logic behind it in terms of how it uh, complements the wider pro strategic proposals. Thank you. Um, I think before we come back to uh, Claire, Baker wanted to ask a, a question around that area, I think it was. Um, yeah, it does kind of follow on from the discussion, I suppose. It's, is there a general feeling, would it be right to say that the um, behavioural section of the document is, uh, is, quite, is quite strong, but the way in which it relates to the rest of RPP2, there are some challenges and questions within that, and members have given examples of waste being quite a successful behavioural change. But that seems that is then supported by quite a strong infrastructure and that's what's driven that change. And we look at something like transport and travel and one of the behavioural challenges be people use their cars less. That's much more difficult to deliver on. Um, do people feel that the document is cohesive in terms of this is what we're trying to change with behaviours? Where's the, this is how we're actually going to do it in all the sections? and that's a reflection on the previous discussion. Linda Alvins. Uh, just, yeah, from, from that point then, um, yes, recycling is acceptable and, and a behavioural change has happened in that, um, but there is still, um, as Stuart said, op opposition to facilities that, that then manage the recycle or manage any type of um, waste that requires infrastructure to, be, to, to return it back into, into a resource and, and, and make it usable. Um, so, so for all parts of that infrastructure, there needs to be more support and, and um, um, I, su I suppose support for, for attitude change um, towards the, the need for that, that intermediate, that just because the recycling is picked up at your door, it doesn't automatically become a glass bottle. Uh, Morag Watson. Just to, to pick up on your, your point about the disconnect, I think the simple answer to that is yes, there is a disconnect between the behaviour change section and the rest of the RPP, which is a shame. As we've said, the government has done very good research and they do have the answers and ways forward there, and we would have liked to see a much more joined up approach. Um, picking up on, on the other aspects of that, with regards to behaviour change, it can sometimes all be lumped together, but different aspects of our behaviour 
tend to be influenced to a greater or lesser extent by different factors. So particularly transport and particularly uh, home energy use tend to be quite dominated by infrastructure. And when you look at uh, how we begin to unpick behaviours in this area, policy and infrastructure interventions are indicated to be the most successful. When it comes to recycling, again, infrastructure has played a major part there. This slightly more uh, contentious issue of we now recycle more of our waste, but our waste, the amount of waste we generate is not going down quite as fast as we would want. The amount of uh, waste we generate is generally not so much governed by infrastructure, much more governed by choice, so a different approach is needed there. Picking up on what's been said by other um, people here about the vision, and particularly around people on low incomes. What we are finding, and there is a growing body of evidence around this, and it is a message that some people struggle with somewhat, framing things in terms of financial savings is generally not found to be the best way of motivating behaviour change. For example, there's recent um, research that's just been published in the Netherlands showing that uh, exactly the same advertising campaign encouraging people to inflate their tyres properly because it saves fuel. One was framed as saving money, not a single person responded to it. Another was framed in contributing to the environment, 27 people responded to it, a very significant, uh, statistically significant result. Um, there is a tendency to think in terms of low income people because money is a very big issue for them, that messages to them should be shaped in terms of finances. Generally, that is not helpful. What we find is what is of greater concern to people is comfort and their health. It is simply the fact that they are cold and miserable in their own homes, and that has a knock-on effect for your physical and your mental health. If we phrase our messages in terms of it simply is not acceptable in a democracy such as ours that we have people who are cold and miserable in their own home and in a situation where they will never be able to make their home warm and comfortable, that is just not acceptable, and we have an agenda about doing something about that, which also has wider benefits. The research would indicate that that is likely to be more effective. I think uh, we'll bring Graham in here at the, at the moment. The housing area is, is very interesting in terms of behavioural change because, obviously, there's other committees looking at various bits of it. Uh, I hope they're being raised there too. Thank you, Camilla. I understand. I think you said that, that research had been done in Holland because I, I wonder if we need to get better at actually joining up the two and get a message across there that if you change your actions as an individual, uh, you know the climate, the environment gains, but so do you financially. And I, and I wonder if we are good enough at getting the message out. Uh, for example, the impact of not leaving a light on overnight. Um, walking to work rather than driving to work, reducing your top speed uh, over a long journey, and illustrating to people what the gains are in terms of emissions and financially, and whether that, by putting both together, would not work uh, in terms of bringing about cultural change or behavioural change. That's uh, an interesting one in terms of what the research tells us. Um, what we find, and it seems counterintuitive, is that financial appeals are actually not very effective and they can, in certain circumstances, be counterproductive. Um, it's a, an interesting thing that comes out from the behaviours, values and frames uh, research that WWS has been doing, that as a population in the UK, and it's only been done at UK level, not specifically at Scottish level, when you ask what people's values are and what they prioritise in life, social justice, fairness, um, family time, being part of community, rate far more highly than money do, does. Um, when you ask people what do they think other people value, money is rated very highly. So what we tend to be finding in messaging is people are framing them in the way they think other people want to hear them, rather than what they feel they would like to do. Um, so in terms of messaging around these uh, particular issues, framing them from a point of view of uh, social justice, from fairness uh, and so on, seems to be far more powerful. What comes through from the research is that one of the most powerful motivators for individuals is our sense of the kind of person we are. To, to give a very trite example, if you wanted to get down your grocery bills, shoplifting would seem to be a good strategy. If you look at the statistics between how much shoplifting there is and how many people get prosecuted for it, you could do a very cold statistical analysis and say, I will probably get away with it. 
The vast majority of people do not shoplift. It simply violates the sense of the kind of person they are, and that is far more powerful than actually the legal uh, consequences of doing so. So, um, and to pick up earlier from our farming example, again, if you look at farming, anyone who knows even something about it knows that it is a very hard job to do, and the financial rewards are not great. You could argue, well, the sensible thing to do would leave farming. 20,000 people are very committed to their farms because there's something far more powerful going on than money. And what we would advocate from the behaviour change research is we need to focus on these far more powerful motivators of human behaviour and money. The research just simply does not support that it is a particularly powerful motivator. We have a couple more points on this and we need to move into some other resource use things fairly soon. Uh, so if you forgive me, we'll bring in Mike Bonaventura and uh, Dick Lyle to follow. One, one um, small add-on point, convener, is that while I think um, Morag's points are, are well made as far as individuals are concerned and perhaps even households, um, work that we've been doing with the <coughs> SME community within the non-traded sector over the last six years or so, um, the financial message is very important to them and in fact is, is more engaging than one of uh, perhaps social justice or, or other. So uh, the point being really that I, I think there are different messages for different constituencies. Okay. And Dick Lyle? Uh, my question is actually in regards to resource uh, convener. Is that okay to move into that? Um, well, if you wait till that time, we'll just get one more point okay, before thanks. we move on to that. You certainly okay. will get a chance. Mike Robinson. Sorry, yeah, just very quick coming back to Claire's comment about the RPP, uh, the behaviour change element of it. I didn't particularly want to just leave it unchallenged that it was great and we could all move on. It's, um, it's fine as far as it goes, but um, an awful lot of it is um, quite high level. It does pick up some things that are very positive, like the if issue of individual social and material uh, aspects of behaviour change. But it, it also puts an awful lot of onus on the document we're still awaiting. So um, it's very difficult to judge in terms of its detail. Uh, it, it's critical in how it integrates. It can't, it's too standalone as it currently sits, where you know, each of the different sectors that are being reported in the RPP2 should be challenged to have a behaviour change component to them. Uh, and also, I think it sort of slightly misses a, a wider point that there is an absolute need, and all behaviour change models would reiterate the need for leadership. And there's a very clear uh, sense that a, something that presents leadership across the board would lift behaviour change across the board uh, at every level. Uh, and the last thing I was going to say, just to pick up on the pounds uh, versus um, morality argument, um, my experience of that is that pounds can get you in the door, but it's not a long-term way to make, bring about change, because the minute the um, finances shift, people stop doing it. So if you want to embed change, you, you can get in the door through talking pounds and pence, but if you don't also talk the other reasons for doing it, you will lose them in the long term. Well, we've got to take resources in order now, um, starting with Angus. McDonald's uh, questions and then Jim Humes, I think we should manage to do these. Angus McDonald first. Okay, thank you. Um, as panel members are aware, uh, there's been significant progress uh, being made with regard to reducing emissions uh, from landfill uh, through the Zero Waste uh, Plan, um, which is a good example, as uh, Simon Pepper alluded to, of uh, behaviour change, or as we perhaps, as he suggested, we should be calling it culture change. Um, and RPP2 confirms that the measure set out in the Zero Waste Plan remains the main policy framework to, to continue uh, progress. Um, can I ask the panel uh, whether they feel the policies outlined in RPP2 for waste and basically the Zero Waste Plan can be relied upon for, for waste to contribute adequately to emissions reductions and what else might be required? Stuart Fraser first. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a, a wee bit of an omission. Um, there needs to maybe a stronger linkage to the Procurement Reform Bill, um, which talks about sustainable procurement. There, there's clearly um, a risk that some of the purchasing decisions that are made by public bodies in today's financially difficult times will be based only on the monetary value of the services and not, not looking at the carbon impact, uh, not looking at the, the community benefit aspects. Um, and although the Zero Waste Plan sets a very good agenda and the Waste Scotland regulations 
set a very good framework and we, we, we have all the policies, we just need to deliver them now. Uh, I think unless we can see that there's a clear recognition of what needs to be done in procurement terms, we may miss some of that opportunity. We may not deliver the outcomes we want. Thank you, Lyle. Um, there's, there's that many questions I could ask in resource uh, use, and, and I, I take from a, a, some time ago, uh, the committee had evidence in regards to waste to heat plants, and originally the, the suggestion that these would be set up throughout Scotland, but I'll, I'll leave that for a minute. I can ask uh, two questions if I can. The former uh, committee, the, the, the TICC committee, Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee, recommended that in developing the RPP in advance of the next RPP, the Scottish Government would consider wider issues in relation to waste and incorporate proposals in relation to all aspects of waste hierarchy and not just on the issue of waste treatment. Does the panel believe that this has been adequately considered in the preparation of RPP2? And under resource use, abatement figures assume there's a general reduction in the amount of waste each person is generating. Is there evidence to support this assumption? James Curran. Um, it's a huge question, this, and if I can respond at least partly to the previous three questions and, and join them up in one way or another. I mean, I think that the whole waste sector and the progress that Scotland has made on, on waste uh, handling, waste management, is an interesting kind of case study for how you might approach the wider issues of, of climate change mitigation. Because waste, waste management is a fairly mature area for at least 15 years there's been ongoing action. Um, and and again, it, it relates back to what I said in my opening remarks about actually within waste management there has been very clear specification of responsibilities against bodies like Scottish Government, SEPA, Zero Waste Scotland and the local authorities. Uh, and a lot of the necessary action in, in uh, managing waste better has been backed up by regulation, and I do mean backed up, it hasn't often been resorted to it itself, and has also been backed up by very specific and focused funding in, in particular areas. So that, that there has been good progress, and that's also been on the back of some significant analysis of behaviour change within certain aspects, again, of the kind of waste management chain. So to me, uh, you, you know, the, the, the example given there is give... Uh, responsibility and accountability for a particular uh, program of work and you'll get all of that kind of detailed analysis and that focused funding and, and everything that will actually deliver against the targets that have been set you know, as uh, waste management has, I think, demonstrated. But, uh, as others have pointed out, is the upstream end, um, the kind of consumer end where the waste is generated, that there hasn't been so much activity uh, because that's not what the, 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 that 15-year program has really been looking at. To go on to that, then, I think there's an enormous amount we still can do. Um, I think there's, there's activity around environmental and clean technologies, which is a program that Scottish Government has, has, has initiated and spans across certainly some work that we do in SEPA, also Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Uh, a, a huge global opportunity to enter into that market and, and be a leader in developing environmental and clean technologies which will provide uh, the, the, the services and goods uh, that are required in the global market but with less waste uh, and generating less downstream emissions and so on. So that, that's an area where I think we need to step up a gear uh, and put more effort in. I think we've, we've certainly um, argued within uh, the development of NPF3 that Scotland still has an opportunity to take a more national and strategic approach to creating zero waste infrastructure. Uh, and such a zero waste infrastructure properly distributed across the country, I believe, would um, uh, remove some of the issues we have around the planning procedures around uh, waste infrastructure and could also deliver much more effectively on things like district heating uh, and the creation of downstream industries, reusing and, uh, uh, and building uh, useful um, businesses on the back of recycled material. Uh, and the, the, the final area where I think uh, more could be done in terms of waste and resource reuse is advice to small and medium-sized enterprises. Zero Waste Scotland is currently tendering uh, the Scotland's energy and resource efficiency 
uh, advisory service to small and medium-sized enterprises, which is fine in itself, public money going into that. Uh, I am a regulator, and I would say there needs to be a quid pro quo there. And in the same way we put our cars through MOTs uh, every now and then, um, Scottish business, I believe, should be required at some very minor level to go through an MOT as well in order to generate the referrals for that energy and resource efficiency advisory service funded out of public money companies should be expected at least to pick up the phone and ask for that advice so you get the referrals into the advisory service but equally at the back end and there's no way that advisory service can ever give the detailed technical uh, requirements to every every cafe that wants to put in uh, uh, more energy efficient cooling or whatever uh, that the, the, the supply industry needs to start uh, providing quality accredited uh, decent advice to uh, those potential customers uh, and take those customers right through the specification tendering, commissioning and sign off of, of the end product. So we, we begin to join up all of these um, actors and activities around waste and resource use. Um, Simon Pepper nodding in agreement. Yes, um, particularly in, in uh, to um, James's yes, last yes. point about um, uh, the sort of idea of a business MOT in order to generate referrals, I thought that was a really interesting idea. Thank you. Um, McDonald to follow it up. Thanks, Convener. Can I just maybe concentrate on, uh, or go back to a point that Stuart Fraser mentioned earlier with regard to energy from waste? Um, you know, clearly we've got a, a way to go on that. Do, do, you, do you feel that we need to be, a, or our PP2 needs to be a bit more visionary uh, with regard to uh, encouraging more energy from waste, and, and should our PP2 be going a, a wee bit further, uh, particularly when we hear that we've just had a contribution with regard to uh, a district heating? Um, you know, that's clearly uh, an option that, uh, that, that, that we should be going down. Yeah. Um, RPPT could be uh, could be a bit more explicit about the benefits that uh, energy from waste can deliver. Uh, once all uh, cost-effective recovery and recycling has been completed, um, it makes a very brief mention about some of the positive aspects, but it really doesn't go any further than that to say that it endorses this as an ultimate treatment method once all, all other avenues have been exhausted in terms of recycling. So I think it could go a bit further in terms of being explicitly um, endorsing of this as a technology option. Linda Evans, <clears throat> appropriately named. <laughs> <laughs> um, on first reading of the, the Waste and Resources chapter, um, I think I was quite surprised that there was a focus on, on landfill gas emissions. It's not a topic that um, the institution and, and the industry is... is talking about as, as much as resource management and, and other areas at the moment, um, and that other things will come into play, like food waste reduction and um, less biodegradable waste, that will make that target quite um, challenging in years to come, just because of the, 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 the lower amount of waste going to landfill and, and, and generally. Um, should the chapter be more about the waste hierarchy and general areas of the plan, um, the reference to the Zero Waste Plan and the, the main drivers within those documents are all aimed at driving waste up the hierarchy and I think um, do give that steer, um, which is where the industry is, is trying to head at the moment. Um, is waste reducing? Yes, the evidence that we have from, from data analysis. Um, we don't have so much on commercial industrial waste at the moment, but certainly in terms of local authority um, collected waste then we're, we've seen a 3% uh, decrease in, in waste generation um, for about the last five or six years. And um, there is now concern about um, if that continues, um, what, what do we do when we, when we get to a point of no return? In terms of waste infrastructure then, there is reference in the waste and resource chapter about policies for um, minimising the requirement for um, residual waste infrastructure, such as energy from waste. And that is in the discussion of waste continue to reduce. Um, however, there is recognition that um, there will always be an element of waste. After all, uh, recycling and, and uh, other methods have been exhausted that, that remains either landfillable or has the potential to be um, an, a, an alternative energy source. Um, and I think we'd like to see more 
referenced in other chapters, such as the heat and the electricity chapter in this, that that can provide through combined heat and power and small plants um, that, that outlet that we need. Thank you. Uh, Jim Hume, yeah. to broaden uh, uh, it. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. It's just maybe to more explore into the res resource use in RPP2. It stated that using materials more efficiently and preventing wastes is fundamental to address carbon impacts, but there's very little detail under supporting enabling measures, and there's no detail uh, regarding uh, a new resource efficient Scotland service that, that is mentioned. Also, so I'd be interested in uh, the panel's views on what uh, thinking should have been included regarding uh, resource use and efficiencies in the RPP2. Yes, uh, Stuart, first of all. It's perhaps unfortunate timing for RPP2 in the, the one or two of the consultation documents. The waste hierarchy, for instance, and the Recyclate Quality Action Plan have just closed, so uh, it may be that we don't have the information available yet to, to incorporate, but the direction of travel that's outlined in those consultation papers, uh, I think, assuming there's no dramatic changes, would give the detail that's not in RPP2. Um, and also in terms of uh, safeguarding Scotland resources, which is talking about setting uh, targets for reduction in, in waste generation uh, and an action programme for trying, trying to achieve that. Um, again, that's recently closed. We've not seen the outcomes. So there's a lot of work going on in those areas which hasn't quite come to fruition as yet. Um, More widely than that. Anybody else want to explore the... Uh and to carry just, I mean, just one final point, which, which actually feeds off what Stuart said a bit earlier, which is that the, the other area where there's a great deal of work is on public procurement, and it is in the private sector as well as in the public sector, there's a big driver around supply chain management and driving resource efficiency right the way down the supply chain, um, which means, again, there's, there's two sides to that. One is if you're a, a small company, you can get ahead of the game by being efficient and therefore more able to get some of the bigger contracts. Um, but I, I think there's a there's a real opportunity, which again is not, it's it's mentioned in here, but it's not captured hugely. But there is a lot of work going on in the public sector um, about driving resource efficiency right the way through the supply chain. So. It's consolidated. It can take in these two gentlemen's points, I believe. Yep. Point well made. Thank you very much for that. We move on to some uh, final points just now. I think on uh, the scope for technical and innovation. Uh, Claudia Beamish is going to lead on it. Um, the RPP um, states that the government intends to choose the most cost-effective mix of technologies and approaches in any sector. The reality is, in many cases, we do not yet know how technologies will develop or how their costs will change or what other disruptive technologies might emerge. We aim, where reasonable and practical, to encourage a portfolio of technologies and create competitive market conditions in which the most sustainable and cost-effective succeed over time. Uh, this uh, does appear to be quite non-committal, uh, and I'm wondering whether, in view of the fact that to be, we, I think we've all acknowledged today that a, a lot of these technologies maybe don't exist yet. It, perhaps that's the reason for, <laughs> for it being non-committal, but um, is the level amb of ambition reasonable, and uh, what else should the RPP2 contain to firm up any policy in the areas of emerging technologies? Um, Andy Kerr first. <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a pet topic of mine. I, I, think, I think one of the, uh, one of the key issues that, that I think is really important um, that we understand within Scotland is that technology innovation in itself does not deliver the, the change we want. And it's a combination of the technology innovation that might be going on with the social and the business innovation that makes it happen. And it's a really good example is, is the, the developments of, of renewable electricity in, in Scotland um, was not delivered because we are the leading you know, wind technology developers in the world. It's because we've actually set the regulatory framework, the financing, and so on to make it happen. So I think they are right in the RPP2 document not to say we are going to specify exactly which technology should happen. The job, I think, for the government is to create that framework within which appropriate technologies work and succeed, which is about the social capital, about the financing frameworks, about clear regulatory frameworks. So I do think we do need to focus on what I would call the social innovation bit 
as much as we do on the, and we do have a lead in technology innovation, and that's fantastic, but that in itself won't determine exactly what, what's happening. So I, I didn't have a problem with the wording of that, because I think that's a, a fair statement. We don't know whether battery technology is going to improve dramatically so we all have electric cars, or we're going to go down a hydrogen route, or we're, you know, these things are just unknown at the moment, but we can create the framework to allow these things to come through and be embedded, but that's actually much more around the social, the business, the cultural innovation, as much as which particular black boxes that we actually use. So I think that's, a, that, so, so I thought that was fair enough myself. Thank you. Uh, James Curran? Yeah, I, th I think Andy's words there just strike me as, as, as very wise, but I'm, I'm sure it helps um, to become known uh, as, as, as for a particular area of expertise, and I think Scotland is in a prime position to become increasingly known globally as, as a low-carbon uh, nation with, with great legislation and delivering on its annual targets in the future. And, and I think any kind of entrepreneurial strategy for Scotland should perhaps build on that, recognise that as a, a, as a marketing uh, um, advantage. And, and I think we do have some um, potential there. I've already mentioned the, the work already going ahead on uh, environmental and clean technologies and I think there are there are some genuinely quite um, interesting and groundbreaking um, proposals for, for example the the hydro nation initiative uh, jointly to be taken forward at least the kind of lead partners uh, named in that being Scottish water clearly James Sutton Institute and ourselves in SEPA uh, and to develop themes around low carbon water management I think is a great opportunity globally and already there are the, the there's the potential to be doing some work, for instance, out in Malawi and Bangladesh and other countries, um, to become known as a, as a nation that can deliver on low carbon water management, combining our low carbon skills with our water skills and targeting a, a huge potential market in the future, I think is exactly the kind of um, a pathway we should be following as a nation. Uh, the only other kind of um, technology I would, I would mention at this point is, is carbon capture and storage, where we have uh, uh, really world-leading um, academic competency around that and as far as I understand we're, we, we still have two uh, possible prototypes within the um, w w within the four that might be taken forward at the UK level so again specific areas related to low carbon entrepreneurism that I think we should be targeting okay, uh, well Mike uh, Robinson first I am um, just very quickly I think that it is in just slightly in danger of being uh, into the um, wishful thinking zone uh, and a large part of delivering uh, reductions now is going to be adoption of existing technologies uh, not through uh, development of you know new ones and uh, whilst they will always improve and it's we don't want to miss the boat or back the wrong horse or whatever there's actually a very large part of the, um, the emphasis for me should be on the wider adoption of those technologies we already know about so that's good um, Mike uh, Bonaventura. Um, I think the <clears throat> availability of technologies and the reliance of RPP2 on their emergence is one example of uh, broader risk in the entire policy that hasn't been addressed. So we start off with some very optimistic, um, general aspirational views of where we're going. Um, we reap the benefits of picking the low-hanging fruit up front, but there's no recognition that it's going to get increasingly harder as we move towards the 2027. Um, therefore, we need something which is rather more specific and a roadmap for specificity as, as we go forward, um, which in turn requires a better understanding of some of the uh, underlying elements. So, for example, a uh, better linkage between environment, economy and society for sustainable development, elements of which have come out today. Um, Trade-offs between the mitigation proposals in RPP2 and some of the adaptation measures that are coming out of the Scottish Adaptation Programme. Um, so there are a number of uh, policy implementations and political risks that I think would do well to be evaluated in some form of risk register to give us a better sense of confidence about the extent to which the programme can deliver 
overall in the long term and what might need to be done to resolve um, incremental challenges and obstacles as, as we go from now to 2027. Very good. Um, Claire Baker, with uh, perhaps a final comment or two, uh, or is it a question? No, thank you, Convener. Can I follow on from Mike? Mike Robinson really yeah. picked up on a few of the points that I was going to mention, um, and whether while we recognise new technologies will have a potential in some way in the future, it's still quite an unknown, and is there any concerns that some of the abatement figures, particularly around transport and uh, rural land use, are maybe a bit over-ambitious? from 2025 onwards, considering there's this kind of, such a high level of um, uncertainty about what will actually deliver this. Andy Kerr. Um, I, I think there is, I mean, there's, a, there's an element of sticking your finger in the air with some of these figures, yes, and, and that is a problem. Equally, I think the transport uh, area, for example, doesn't pick up on an, area, uh, on a, on a, on an issue that's, that's coming very rapidly up, which is about the use of information technology and transport and linking the two together to actually make much better use of information for drivers in the sense of personalised travel plans and so on to allow them to avoid congestion, to reduce fuel use and so on and so forth. So th there's a whole bunch of areas in there which is not touched here, which potentially over the next 10 years could see really quite dramatic changes. So it is very difficult to try and forecast what is going to be important and what is not. I, I actually think Mike's point about saying let's have a risk register of what's more likely and what's less likely is a very good idea, actually. Um, but, you know, I would absolutely concur that you don't set this out as being we hope something will come in in 15 years time you say most of this we can deliver with the existing technologies or by the application of existing technologies in new markets you know so the use of information technology with transport for example um, you're not developing new technologies or at least they're you know they're not major new developments but you are starting to deliver very radical changes so um, yes i think that is an issue it's a challenge for the rpp2 um, but I think there's as many things that are missed out here as, as are in there which, are, which, which need to be captured going forward. Um, it's interesting, you know, we've been hearing news today about the setting up of uh, charging points for um, electric vehicles. And in a way, it, you know, I presume the panel would agree that we're talking about technical innovation here, um, them being available along trunk roads, no further than 50 year, miles apart, at ferry ports, at uh, leisure centres, things like that. It's an incentive to drivers to think about moving to electric cars, and that's showing leadership by government in that, that extent. But um, obviously, it's also areas that are not sp specifically mentioned in RPP2, but it's an example of the kind of thing that's going on that feeds into this. I think um, possibly you would agree that these are, that's a, it's quite a good example, it's just sort of uh, cropped up. Indeed. Um, there, yes, Claire. If anyone, because uh, I was, apologies for being late this morning, it was um, childcare responsibilities, but if anyone had heard Cole Kay's phone in this morning, there's quite a lot to do in terms of behavioural attitude of the public before I think they'll accept electric cars to the extent we need them to when we look at how important they are to RPP2. Some of us were at work. <laughs> <laughs> and you were in domestic work. I know that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I'm not disparaging that at all. Um, my childcare issues and so on. Absolutely. Uh, Mike Robinson to finish up just now. Sorry, just responding to Claire. Really, um, I, I suppose overall, the thing for me is that if there were more um, policies relating to things that could be done now and adoption of those things, we know we can do now a little bit more quickly. Um, there would be less need to rely on uh, the hopeful scenarios going forwards, and particularly transport is a good example where fairly substantial delivery of transport in the long term is, is uh, through lower emissions potential in transport, which remains very undefined, uh, and uh, putting so many eggs in that particular vague basket seems unnecessary when we could be bringing certain parts of that programme forward now. So. Transport stuff will be dealt with then. In another committee, as we say. Um, we've gone round uh, the houses on quite a lot of things there, which provides us with a heck of a lot of information to analyse. And certainly some of the behaviour change stuff in this panel has been fascinating. And I think it allows us to be uh, potentially much more focused in our final document that we draw up uh, and uh, present, in our view, as the committee, 
to the RPP discussion uh, when uh, the, the, the matter comes to the Chamber, as it will. So thank you very much to you all for your efforts and uh, to enlighten us, to inform us, and, uh, and so on. And uh, I believe that we'll be coming back to it in the near future. So to all of the panel, thank you very much. This is the end of the public section of this uh, uh, meeting. We have a private section after this, uh, which we need to move to fairly quickly. So can I ask you not to linger too long uh, in the room here? Thank you very much.